programme time. Nineteen response. Item one on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 9th of April. Members are asked to note that the minutes which the Deputy Chair has agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published on the, as official report, which is available on the committee's web page. Item two is a statement from the Minister of Health. The Speaker received notification on the 9th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 8. And I would like to welcome the Minister of Health to this meeting of the committee. I invite the Minister to make a statement which should be heard by members without interruption. And following the statement will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon. And I welcome the opportunity to update members with the latest developments regarding COVID-19. As I have said in numerous statements to the Assembly, to the Committee and to the public, we are living in unprecedented times. People are understandably anxious. People are worried about the safety of their families, especially those who are older or who have underlying conditions. People are unnerved by the empty streets and town centres. And of course, after this morning's news that our economy is currently experienced, experiencing its fastest and deepest decline in the history of Northern Ireland, people are understandably concerned about the future that for the future will hold for them. We are living through scenes that only three months ago would have been wholly unimaginable. For future generations, 2020 will be remembered as the year of the coronavirus. This is a serious virus, and we have seen in too many countries right across the world the frightening pace at which it has spread. However, we must remember that for the vast majority of people who contract it, the virus will be mild and they will make a full recovery. However, as we all know, not everyone who gets it survives. Sadly, there are homes right across the country who are grieving, and no matter how long this lasts, we must never, ever forget that behind every statistic is a human being, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a friend, a person who will have been loved and is now missed. From all the briefings I get and from all the calls and meetings that I take part in, nothing drives home the tragedy of this virus more than seeing the pictures of funerals with only a very small number of permitted mourners. Wakes and large funerals are understandably not able to happen right now, but that is not how we usually say goodbye to our loved ones. I also want to take this opportunity once again put on my record my sincere thanks to all those who continue to deliver our vital services, our frontline health and social care staff, our police officers, those who are looking after the children of our key workers and those who are ensuring that there are supplies on the shelves. There are too many to mention, but I think it is important that we recognise here today the significant time, energy and commitment that has been invested by so many to keep us safe in our homes. I would now like to take some time to explain the approach that I have adopted to deal with this emergency and to outline to you some of the significant actions which have been key to my response. There has been much focus and discussion on the issue of personal protective equipment, testing and the reporting of COVID-19 related deaths in recent days and weeks. And I would like to assure you today that I and my team across the health and social care sector are acutely aware of the challenges arising from these issues, and we are working tirelessly to ensure that every conceivable effort is being made to help people keep safe, stay at home and to protect our NHS. Key to informing the decisions that I and executive colleagues will need to make in the weeks and months ahead is the work being undertaken by the COVID modelling group. The projections provided by this group are informing the work that needs to be progressed to ensure there is sufficient PPE available, that testing is scaled up, that our hospitals, GP services and community pharmacies have capacity to deal with the demands they are facing, and that key services within the community are prepared to deal with the challenges they are facing today and every day, 
until this disease has been defeated. To meet the additional need for staff, once again our health workers have stepped up. Many hundreds have gone through additional training, and as of 6.30 this morning, today the HSC Workforce Appeal, which was only launched three weeks ago, that appeal has had 18,354 expressions of interest, which have been converted to 10,777 formal applications to date, a conversion rate of nearly 59%. And that's double what would normally be ex expected in a recruitment campaign. In fewer than three weeks, almost 300 people have been offered or appointed to posts, with over 3,000 now job ready or about to be job ready, subject to completion of final checks. Clinical applications, of which there have been 2,784, have been prioritised for processing. This includes former doctors and nurses who are returning to service, many from retirement. And I pay tribute to their dedication and thank all the applicants for rallying to this cause. The team is now turning its attention to processing the 7,993 non-clinical support worker applications. This support will be crucial in our response to COVID-19. Online applications have currently been paused while the team works through these applications. The campaign is sophisticated and social media driven, so further expressions of interest can be sought quickly if there are further areas of high demand. It is important to note that we are putting processes in place to support the independent sector, in addition to the HSC, from applicants to the workforce appeal. The response from our pharmacists and primary care colleagues has been phenomenal. Despite all pressures, our chemists remain open and continue to provide their essential service. Similarly, as members will know, we have opened a series of COVID-19 centres, 10 in total, where they have seen over 1,300 patients already. They have moved mountains, and I have no doubt will continue to do so. And importantly, along with a number of additional supports across the community and government, the HSC is also putting in place mental and emotional support for their workers at this very difficult, challenging and often emotional time. Modelling colleagues have indicated that the peak here may now potentially be less severe than we had feared in the first wave at least. I am sure you will all agree with me when I say that it is reassuring, but not surprising, to see the positive and responsible approach adopted by the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland who adhere to social distancing over the Easter holidays. We have risen to the challenge, and I have no doubt will continue to do so. We cannot be certain of how this first wave will play out. No modelling can predict the future, but we can acknowledge that the unprecedented social distancing restrictions on all our lives are starting to make an impact, but there can be no grounds whatsoever for complacency. The focus now, as much as ever, has to be on staying at home, saving lives and protecting our health service. Difficult times lie ahead, I have no doubt, but I am confident that we are ready to face them together. And indeed, I and my executive colleagues are working closely to ensure that we are working as one in our plans and in our actions. In partnership with the Department for the Economy, Northern Ireland's further and higher education institutions are now making an invaluable contribution to the fight against COVID-19 by creating personal protective equipment and joining the research for a vaccine. In partnership with the Department of Education, we have developed a package of measures to provide emergency childcare for key workers. In partnership with the Department of Infrastructure, a number of MOT centres have become available to now test people rather than vehicles. In partnership with the Department of Communities, the response to this emergency has been focused on the local community by the local community. Indeed, across every department, partnership has working has resulted in innovations and progress that we could not have imagined possible just a matter of weeks ago. Turning now to the issue of PPE specifically. I have been clear about the challenges with PPE. COVID-19 is a worldwide issue, and protecting staff and patients impacts as much elsewhere as it does locally. The pressure on supplies are significant globally, and as I have said on a number of occasions, that there is not a country in the world that truly knows the path this virus is going to take. But would I like to have more? Of course I would. And that is why I am committed to ensuring that we rigorously pursue every viable supply source, both locally 
and elsewhere. The Four Nations PPE plan was published last Friday, and we are working closely with England, Scotland and Wales on all aspects of that plan. We have already supported each other by nature of mutual aid, and this will continue in the weeks and months ahead. I know there have been some concerns expressed at the fact that in recent weeks I had agreed to mutual aid England. I confirm that I did send 250,000 gowns to England over the last two weeks. These supplies will be immediately reimbursed once their own stocks arrive. But equally, when I recently reported a, a shortage of eye protection equipment, England and Wales acted quickly to help us. And of course, we must remember all of this is in the context the UK Government has already sent Northern Ireland over 5.6 million items of PPE. So I make no apologies for sharing our stock, because when we need some, the other UK nations are not reluctant to share theirs. That demonstrates the value and success of the Four Nation approach we have been taking. None of us can work on our own in our battle against COVID, because equally we continue to explore the new supply lines with the Republic of Ireland. We have significantly increased supplies from local agents. Local industry has to be commended as it continues to show itself to be adaptable, innovative and responsive to changing operational environments. China is the most significant source of worldwide supplies. The work led by the Department of Finance and Department of Health to secure PPE is important and at a critical stage. We continue to work to ensure all possible steps are taken to open up a supply chain which meets our needs and supports our Four Nation approach. I have already underlined the vital importance of distribution and the deployment to all frontline settings and stressed that all staff must know where to turn within their organisations when they have concerns or questions. But I would remind colleagues of the scale of this issue. We must continue to support our staff and indeed the broader community in helping them understand and make informed decisions about when and how PPE should be used. The correct use of this precious resource is equally as important as confidence on supply chains. However, if we are asking staff to trust the guidance on what PPE they need, then they are understandably relying on us to get the right PPE to them and at the time they need it. That is why, after speaking to the Chief Medical Officer, we have now agreed that there is going to be a thorough examination of the flow of PPE. I have made it clear that it would be inexcusable if delays were seeing PPE remaining in stores or in trust buildings waiting for onward allocation while staff and care facilities were going without. Turning now to another key issue that I have been focused on, and that is the provision of testing and the significant role it has and must continue to play in our fight against COVID-19. Again, I would like to reassure you that testing is growing and will continue to do so as rapidly as possible. As of this morning, the total number of individuals tested for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland stands at 13,672. That figure includes 4,151 healthcare workers. However, it is important to note that as testing was not specifically targeted at healthcare workers at the outset, this figure may underestimate the true number of healthcare workers tested. Members, in today's figures, we are also reporting an additional 121 confirmed cases and, sadly, a further six deaths. That represents six more families in mourning, and we should keep them in our thoughts at this time. I am also aware that in recent days there has been growing commentary that if our testing capacity stands at over 1,000, which I am glad that it does, why the number of tests being reported daily is often below that. Whilst there are a number of issues that can have an impact on the daily figures, an important point that I wish to stress to members and members of the media is that it often takes more than one test to confirm a positive or negative diagnosis. So of the 577 individuals that are being reported today, a number will have been more tested more than once. So we have carried out many more than 577 tests. The difference in tests and testing capacity is not what it may first appear. I am also committed to further scaling up our daily capacity through existing health and social care laboratory space and through external partners, both
both at local and national level. Just yesterday, I visited DERA's Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute with my executive colleague, Minister Putz, to talk with officials there on the work that they are, will now undertake as part of a consortium within Queen's and Ulster University to assist the health service in testing up to 1,000 samples a day from suspect COVID-19 cases. You will also be aware that testing has also now been carried out at a number of DVLA sites to support local trust capacity and through the national in initiative at the SSE Arena testing site and soon at a second testing site in Londonderry, which is due Im Im imminently. Further sites are at an advanced stage of development. In addition, the expert working group has also been established to lead on the expansion of testing across all our laboratory services, both within health and social care facilities, and also to consider options for the utilisation of other testing facilities, including within the commercial sector. In the testing strategy that has been shared with the Executive and the Health Committee, I have made it clear that the overall testing policy will be adjusted over time as testing capacity increases and priority groups for testing are expanded. Similarly, the strategy also includes a pledge that testing will soon move towards surveillance of COVID-19 in the population to inform planning of services, including surge capacity, and to estimate population immunity. I know members will also be keen to hear an update on the issue of COVID-19 related deaths within care homes. And I'd like to take a few minutes to reassure members that care home providers and staff in Northern Ireland are working extremely hard to keep some of the most vulnerable people in our society safe. And I would like to recognise their commitment and dedication here today. I am committed to providing all the support they need to continue this, to continue this vital work. And as such, the Public Health Agency is working very closely with local care homes, providing expert support and detailed advice in the event of infections and outbreaks occurring. Where care home residents and or staff are symptomatic, they are being tested and testing is being increased. There has been much focus in recent days on deaths that occur inside or outside of hospital settings. Let me again be clear. Every single one of our residents in nursing and care homes matter just as much as every other citizen in our society. The process of registering deaths in the community takes a number of days and involves a doctor completing a death certificate and a number of additional steps undertaken by the General Register Office and the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. NISRA does publish a weekly bulletin on all deaths registered in Northern Ireland, and from this week, the bulletin will provide information on all COVID-related deaths registered in Northern Ireland across both hospital and community settings. However, for clarity on this issue, I'd also like to highlight that many of the deaths of our care home residents are already being captured in the figures being published as many of the patients are first being admitted to hospitals. Members, I'm conscious that my statement is a, a lengthy one and that you will be keen to ask a number of questions on a range of issues. But I'd like to take another few moments to update you on some of our key actions which are ongoing to support the emergency response across the HSC. A key component in the emergency response has been worked to maximise HSC's capacity to treat COVID-19 patients. Each trust has also taken steps to significantly increase critical care capacity at local hospitals. We now have 143 adult ICU beds, with a further 12 paediatric beds. Today, there are 49 COVID patients in ICU, with a further 39, 38 non-COVID. Thankfully, that means as it stands, and before even more beds come in line for any further increase in critical care admissions, we have 56 spare ICU beds. We also have 197 ventilators, but as was demonstrated with the Prime Minister's recent, recent ICU experience, not all ICU patients require ventilation. We also have 3,820 geriatric and acute beds. At present, there are currently 603 COVID-related inpatients, including both confirmed 
and or suspected cases. There are a further 1,345 non-COVID patients in hospitals across Northern Ireland, meaning that as it stands, we have almost 1,900 empty beds. If our modelling is accurate, this should be more than sufficient capacity to meet this surge. In the events of an extreme surge, Northern Ireland's first Nightingale Hospital has now been established at Belfast City Hospital. The unit will initially treat a mixture of patients who are critically ill and those who require admission to a hospital with less acute symptoms. However, if the surge is more severe than expected, this new regional unit will have the capacity to treat up to 230 ventilated patients from across Northern Ireland. In this scenario, if local ICU services come under severe pressure, either due to the weight of demand or due to staff absence, they may need to be folded into the Nightingale Hospital in a carefully planned and phased process, while ensuring that local services are still equipped to safely treat a small number of critically ill patients. However, I would stress that much of the day-to-day non-COVID business of the health service continues. People are still having strokes and people are still having heart attacks. That is why I would urge anyone who suspects they need to talk to a doctor or present to a hospital to do so. Whilst having empty beds is positive, equally, I don't want to see people who need to be in hospital not coming forward. In recent days, I have also approved two decisions to activate uh, military aid to civil authority. This was an issue that I announced almost a fortnight ago that I was minded to do. The first decision relates to the need to redistribute medical equipment between hospitals across Northern Ireland to ensure that all hospitals have the necessary equipment, including ventilators, required to fully enact their surge plans. The second relates to the provision of technical advice and assistance to explore the potential for the development of a new temporary Nightingale facility. There have been lessons learned in the course of our preparations for this surge, and one of these is the need for a regional facility that can react quickly to changing patterns of demand in the event of extreme surge of COVID-19 patients. In addition, HSC trusts are now accessing the independent sector hospitals to treat urgent non-COVID patients. Across a number of elective specialities, Specialities. It is expected that between 120 to 135 procedures will be carried out per week across a range of red flag and urgent cases. And these will include breast surgery, gynecology surgery, plastic surgery, urology procedures, general surgery, and optic pathology, as well as potential for a small number of local anaesthetic procedures to be undertaken. The HSC will fund this activity on the basis of compensating the independent sector on a net cost recovery, not for profit basis. And so to next steps. I very much wish I could provide some certainty on what the future holds for us all. Modelling has indicated that we are now in the peak of the first wave of the pandemic. But it is too early to confirm whether the current figures represent the peak. In the absence of a vaccine, we will have to plan for a potential second wave of COVID-19 cases later in the year, once restrictions are eased or lifted and normal life gradually resumes. While there are grounds for hope that the outbreak can be brought under control through maintenance of the current restrictions, coupled with the continuation of the high level of compliance that has been observed by the people in Northern Ireland, the outbreak has not yet reached the point where the restrictions can be relaxed. The progress achieved through good adherence to the restrictions by the people of Northern Ireland will be lost very quickly if there is any adverse change in compliance with the existing social distancing measures or relaxation of the restrictions which help achieve that compliance. It is clear that in Northern Ireland, as elsewhere in the world, The restrictions are causing hardship, distress, anxiety and economic harm. They represent a level of interference with family life, work, religious practice, social and cultural activity, leisure, sporting and educational pursuits that is alien to our way of life. My department has carried out the required review 
of the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Northern Ireland Regulations 2020. And drawing on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer, on the back of that review, the Executive today has agreed that the restrictions and requirements set out in the regulations continue to be necessary if we are to continue to flatten the epidemic curve and manage the capacity of health service and keep COVID-19 deaths to a minimum. There will be a further review which will inform how we progress and the position will be closely monitored. However, now, as before, the message remains the same. Please keep safe, stay home and protect our NHS as they are working to protect us. I will conclude by appealing to members and the general public. I have previously expressed concern about noise on social media and elsewhere, distracting from the work we are doing and from our life-saving measures to the public. That noise remains a challenge. We seem to have a lot of self-appointed experts commenting minute by minute. We seem to have a lot of people on Twitter who have secured dog drits and epidemiology in a few short weeks. They are entitled to their opinions. They are not entitled to their own facts. I would urge everyone to avoid speculation or rushing to judgment, comparing our statistics and our actions favourably or otherwise with other countries, because it's premature at best. It is highly likely that this planet is going to be battling the coronavirus well into 2021 at least. The prospect of a second surge later this year must weigh heavily on all our minds. This is no time for final verdicts to be delivered, favourable or critical, because we are in this for the long haul. We will also have to face up to difficult conversations down the line about when or if to ease any social distancing restrictions. That time is not now. At this moment in time, we have to stick firmly with the measures we have. But the time will come for those discussions, and we have to face them together, honestly and openly. There won't be any easy decisions, because simply maintaining the current lockdown indefinitely would have serious repercussions for many people's mental and physical well-being. So we will all have to weigh up our options very carefully, working closely with colleagues across these islands to ensure we take the right decisions at the right time. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his statement. And now I will invite members to ask the Minister questions. I will have a period of one hour for this. And it is my intention to allow every member in the chamber to ask the question. But of course, I need your cooperation to be focused and succinct in your questions to enable that to happen. Members may ask one question, and it must be related to the statement made by the minister. The chair of the health committee will be allowed some latitude to ask an additional question, as is normal. And I now invite Colin Gilgenew, the chair of the health committee, to ask the question. Gormay Agat, Las Cian Corlia, uh, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement here today um, and to acknowledge and endorse his comments in relation to the, the hard work of staff. And also, I'd like to pass my condolences to those additional six families who have been bereaved as a result of this dreadful virus. In your statement, Minister, you referenced the fact that modelling cannot tell us what, what the future holds. However, we have been aware for some time from the World Health Organization and from the European Centre for Disease Control that the way to fight and tackle this virus is to test, to then trace the people who have been in contact with positive tests and to isolate those people. In light of that, and in light of it's my view that that testing should have happened probably more, more extensively longer ago, the Chinese have a saying that the best time to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So I would like to ask you today, Minister, what plans are in place and when will you be in a position to roll out testing to our care home sector and to the staff who work there in order to protect the most vulnerable people in our society? 
The second question I have in relation to you mentioned in your statement that, that you would rigorously pursue every viable supply source in relation to PPE. And you will know that I wrote to you some weeks ago in relation to the European procurement scheme. And my question in relation to that is, were you made aware of that scheme by the British government? And would you have taken part in it had you been? And also, are you now pursuing the potential for us to purchase PPE equipment for our frontline staff via that route? Corby Hagen. And I, I thank the member, or sorry, I thank the chair um, for his for, for his questions, but also want to thank him for, for the support that he's given um, to our healthcare workers as well, because I know the support that he has given as well is greatly received and appreciated. In regards to, to testing, we are now moving into a position, especially with the additional 1,000 uh, tests per day coming online with AFPI, where we can move into our next phase of testing, which is exactly as the chair lays out in the, the testing plan um, that we shared with the committee, and how we move once we get out of this phase how we actually look to find out where the virus is within the community and how we make sure we can lock that area, not lock it down physically, but also lock down the virus within that area down as well. And we do that by, by testing and by tracing. So the, the Chair is well aware that we've always been pushing to try and get as many tests as we can potentially done in Northern Ireland. So, so by the partnership working that we're seeing, um, both within our own health labs, within the labs of AFPI, but also by taking part in the national testing programme, that ability to test more people will enable us to take that to the next step, which is something I want to do as quickly as, as possible, and I think the chair, the chair is well aware of that. In regards to, to testing in our care home, we put out a, a, no, a notice at the start of the week that any, any resident within a care home, and I say that, I say that with a vision, because I've heard people talking about, you know, about patients in care homes, the residents, the residents in care homes, that anyone who has shown symptoms are symptomatic, they will be tested. That's the guarantee we've made, and that's what we do. Because it's vital that we give the support to those people in the care homes that they get tested as they need it, also the staff. But it's also about giving that reassurance to the family members of those people in the care homes that we're also there to make sure that they're receiving the support and the protection that they required. If, if the chair remembers, we actually took criticism at the start uh, because we closed down visiting um, to care homes quite early, and the emotional stress that that did have. But when we looked today, when I announced yesterday that we had 32 care homes with uh, COVID um, positive patients at that minute in time, that related to one in 12 of the care homes in, in Northern Ireland that had that. That had that. Uh, I, I suppose that statistic. Whereas across the water, we were looking in England at one in six. So I'm hopeful that that early intervention will have restricted the number of care homes where we actually see positive cases, and we are making statements, um, and we are making uh, further support measures available for those. In regards to the PPE, he, he asked very, very specifically, I, I haven't seen the letter that, it, that he's written to me, but that would be one of many, I, I'm sure, that's there. I, I wasn't made aware of the EU-wide procurement scheme, and, and I can say that openly standing here. I wasn't, I wasn't briefed on it at that point in time. Would I have availed of it? The member knows well I would avail of any scheme, any mechanism that can get PPE to our frontline workers. And that's why I'm thankful, actually, working by the member's party colleague as Minister of Finance, that we have progressed the work that we're doing, um, both internationally and locally, in sourcing PPE supplies for our frontline, frontline staff. Uh, and the member will well know about the Minister of Finance and how he's working with representatives um, in China as well that are actually working with the British Embassy out there to secure that, that supply line coming from, from China. But more importantly, is also the ability for us to, to repurpose and reskill um, our own manufacturing processes here in Northern Ireland, because that economic support and recovery is, is, is vital uh, to some of those members, some of those individuals as well. So when I was with the, the party's members' colleague, again, the Minister of Finance, when I, when I was with him, was with Hukamaki uh, in West Belfast, who will be able to upskill to provide four million face shields per day. That's a vital piece of PPE equipment that our frontline workers need. And when we start to produce that locally, it means we can get that security of supply chain. Because I think one of the things that this incident, or this, the, the, the development of, of this virus has actually proven in regards to our supply chains, especially in, in the likes of PPE, that just-in-time international delivery pipeline is good when there's no threat. But once we start to see the threats, 
We need to make sure that we have the ability to secure our own PPE and support our individuals from within some of our home markets. So there, there was an e there's an e-tendering um, process uh, for additional Northern Ireland suppliers and manufacturers to come online. Uh, was been managed by CPT as the Department of Finance. I actually closed at midday yesterday, is my belief. So speaking earlier on with the Minister of Finance, they're working th through the ways and the op options and offers that went into that, that bidding process so that we can get more Northern Ireland companies up and running and producing PPE. And I invite Pam Cameron to ask a question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to the House today. Um, Minister, you had referred to um, the uh, good reaction from the public in terms of uh, the very stringent measures that have been put in place, and, and that includes obviously social distancing. Um, and just in order to give context to my question, I wanted to read um, a little bit of the guidance uh, given in terms of a question on the government um, site, which is um, the question was asked Can I exercise more than once a day if? I need to due to a significant health condition and it goes on to say if you leave your home for medical need if you are a person in your care have a specific health condition that requires you to leave the home to maintain your health including if that involves travel beyond your local area then you can do so this could for example include where individuals with learning disabilities or autism require specific exercise in an open space two or three times each day ideally in line with care plan agreed with a medical professional um, Minister, can you clarify or give us um, uh, or produce further guidelines to this particular piece of government guidance, given the very large number of in individuals that have uh, a diagnosis of autism within Northern Ireland? Yeah. I thank the Vice Chair um, for her question, and I do know, I, I do know how she has been a long, long time champion for the, those with autism. And I know the challenge that the, the current social distancing and the, the stay-at-home restrictions are putting on some individuals who, who have autism and, and suffer from being, being, being confined with, within their own homes. Um, I, I was part of a ministerial Four Nations uh, advice, uh, meeting earlier on, uh, which we are actually indicating they're seeing a 21% increase in calls to those support lines, the likes of Samaritans. In regards to, to the specific guidance for those, those with autism, um, I, I think the key point that she refers to is the care plan with regards to advice from a medical professional. So for those who need to go outside their home for more than once per day, it would be with that guidance and support from a medical professional. But I, I'm, I, I, I'm willing to get specific guidance to the member in regards to autism because I'm also conscious that that guidance also advises that any physical activity that should be undertaken should actually be limited to activities close to home as well. So it's not about getting in the car to go to somewhere else to go for a walk, it's about using, that, um, uh, using the, the area that's close to your home for that, that support and always remaining in mind with the other social distancing regulations to remain two metres apart from anybody else you meet apart from this, who, unless they're a care or a member of your own individual home. So it's in relate, and related to that guard, guidance, there is, I suppose, um, percep or exclusions or, or specific uh, cases that under medical care guidance advising that people can go outside their homes for more than once, but it's not something that I would want to see abused. It's something I would want people to do under, under advice and guidance, so I'm happy to get more, more guidance to the member. Nicole Cole McGrath. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. And also, can I commend the Minister on the work that he's been doing over the last period of time in some very difficult circumstances? It's not very often that ministers get praised, but certainly within my constituency, people are recognising the work that you're doing. So I want to pass on that uh, message. Um, could I ask the Minister, in terms of care homes and the deaths, is it a possibility? Is, there has been a change to how. Uh, deaths are verified and certified, uh, maybe not so much in the certifying side, but certainly in the verifying side. Is that what's causing some of the time lag in terms of it maybe being people that are not doctors and nurses, but maybe some of the care home staff that are doing the verification? Is that causing a slight delay uh, in the reasons for, for deaths, making it through to doctors who then certify it? Because that could take uh, several days for that to come through. 
And if we said that against some statistics, um, last week NISRA stated that we had 434 deaths, with 55 of them being coronavirus related. But if we compare that week to the average over the last five years, there's actually a 30% increase in the number of deaths, which means that there's probably about 80 deaths that sort of aren't fitting to the statistics that we've had over the last number of years. And is there maybe an opportunity in there that some of those deaths are actually related to coronavirus but aren't being recorded? So is there a possibility of trying to tighten up as best we possibly can how deaths are actually uh, verified and certified? And again, um, you know, the member brings to, to light, which is, I, I suppose, one of the current issues we're dealing with. Um, but I, I suppose it's, it's always one of those issues when members or, or any individual or even members of the media start to talk about numbers. What I want to say to people, please remember these are individuals. Because too often in these conversations when people start to look at graphs and they start to look at numbers, they forget there's a loved one behind every one of them. And in regards to, to, to where we are specifically in Nisra, it was a piece of work that we were doing uh, between the Public Health Agency and NISRA, which falls within the Department of Finance, to ensure that we were capturing uh, every death that was related to coronavirus. So what we're seeing in regards to, to I suppose, the, dis the discrepancy between the PHA reported deaths and those coming through in NISRA are specifically those being reported by the PHA have been tested and confirmed with coronavirus in the last 28 days usually um, and bereaved and pass away within a hospital setting. Uh, the other deaths that are recorded additionally with COVID uh, that are being reported by NISRA are those who are... If, if, the remember, if the member recalls when we first started reporting deaths, we're talking about deaths in Northern Ireland, it was, it was because someone had passed away with COVID with an underlying condition. NISRA picks up those deaths of someone who dies with a condition with COVID as an underlying condition. So NISRA picks up those people that die with COVID, but not of COVID. So there's a, I think it's more, a more rigorous way that they actually record the deaths rather than someone being missed in them. But I think something we have to be cognizant of, and it's something that's actually been raised across a number of, a number of countries as well, is those additional deaths. Those additional deaths that fall outside what is the normal average? An awful way to talk about death, but you know, when it's 143 that the member uh, refers to. So there is a greater piece of work going on within NISRA to break down where those deaths are, what's the underlying cause. Because, as I said in my statement, what does concern me as health minister that those people who may have had a stroke or may have had a mild heart attack are staying away from hospitals rather than going seeking help and support. So it's a, it's, a, it's a message I want to put out here. If you still need to go to a GP, if you still need to go to a hospital, please do. Don't be afraid to do so, because the NHS is here to help. I call Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for a statement. And he doesn't need to have any support from us, because he's got it in ample spades. But I would particularly welcome the re revelation that there's been over 4,151 healthcare workers have been tested so far. Um, can the minister give a commitment that we now have sufficient testing capacity, both through the local and national routes testing channels, so that we can test all the healthcare workers that do indeed need to be tested? Thank you very much. Indeed. And again, I suppose I should have said it in, in response as well to, to Colin McGrath's question as well. You know. When people talk about praise of me, folks, this isn't, this isn't about praise. The only reason that the department is seen to be doing the job that it's doing is because of the workers within our National Health Service and across our community pharmacy and also filling our shop shelves and all that. Keep, so th this, is, this is not about any individual or, or any individual department. This is about society in Northern Ireland actually working. In, in regards to the testing of our, our health care workers, I'm now in a, in a confident place that if, if a healthcare worker needs tested, they can get tested. Should it be through so, the, the testing facility within the trust, or those that are done through the national uh, testing facility currently, one of the SSE, and as I said in my statement, one that will be open shortly in Londonderry, and hopefully within the next couple of weeks there will be a further one in the south and southwest as well that can pick up and, and actually utilise the Randox test. Um, but in regards to making sure we can get frontline healthcare workers 
um, tested. We, we, we can do that. In regards to, I suppose, those uh, staff members um, across the health and social care trusts, um, an updated figure, and I, I suppose one of the things that members of, or members always look to, the media always looks to, the public wants to look to, is, is numbers. Um, of the 60,096 uh, people we have working in health and social care trusts, um, and this is, this is data as, as of the 10th, um, that, that is the most recent we have. We have 274 staff out because of COVID-19, so that's 0.4% 0 .4 of the workforce um, as of the 10th, and there's more update figures coming shortly. And the number of staff who are isolating is 1,430, so 2.1% of the health and social care staff are self-isolating. Now, that may be because they're shielding because of underlying health reasons. So 2.5% of the entire health and social care staff um, were off at that point in time, but that compares to 3.6 or 2,500 members of staff who are also off at this moment in time for other health matters as well. So when it comes to testing our health and social care staff, we will make sure that they get tested when they need to be tested. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Health Minister. Um, Minister, you, you'll re recall that um, at a health meeting, health committee meeting a few months ago, I raised the issue of guidance for expectant parents, and I asked you at that time to put up the guidance from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Since then, that has been updated, and the section relating to um, um, employees, frontline employees who are pregnant, would be that they should go and seek to have an ad move into an admin role or other um, parts of the, the health trust. Um, that isn't always happening. And, be, and even though they may, may have PPE or other risk assessments carried out, there are, other, there are frontline healthcare workers who are living with chronic stress right now because they, are, they don't feel that they should be in work. They feel that this is having an impact on their pregnancy, etc., and could possibly lead then to long-term issues around um, perinatal mental health, for example. What is your assessment of the current support that pregnant frontline workers are getting, and what is the long-term plan for supporting them going forward? Thank you. And, you know, again, um, if, if a member has a case like this, you know, bring it to me because I'm prepared, to, I'm prepared to look at it should have been on an individual basis. As, as the member referred, you know, the advice on guidance was updated. Um, it should be in the, the remit of the employer to offer an alternative working place. If they're not and they can't do that successfully, then I'm happy to, I'm happy to look at that, that case and take it forward. So if the member wants to talk to me outside this, this briefing here today, because I don't think it's appropriate to discuss individual cases, but more in the, the generality, um, I, I'll check the guidance that is to, is to trust, but I think as the member referred to, it was updated and the advice and guidance says they should be moved to an admin position or a position that doesn't require them to have um, interaction with patients who may propose a risk. But as, again, if the member has specific cases, I'll take that up with her and she can contact me. Members, I need your cooperation. You need to be focused and succinct if everyone's going to be able to ask the question. I call Alex Easton. Deputy Speaker, um, could I thank the Minister for his statement and as he knows I fully support everything he's been doing and his staff and indeed the health service and have to pay tribute to them for the excellent work you've all been doing. In terms of the independent sector, uh, in particular nursing homes, within my own constituency um, there is one nursing home where there are 10 cases of COVID-19 uh, and speaking to some of the staff there seems to be an issue of PPE getting out to the independent sector. Is that an area where we could possibly use the army to get supplies out to, to ensure that uh, they all have the, the correct PPE? I thank them, you know, again, for the member for, for raising this point. And I'll say to him, there, there shouldn't be an issue um, with, with PPE. As the member indicates, the independent or the private sector care homes have, have direct access. They have a point of contact within each trust should they have an issue with PPE. Um, there's also support mechanisms if there are uh, COVID positive patients within care homes. There are support mechanisms there within the public health agency, but also within the RQIA. Um, what we did a number of weeks ago was actually move some staff in the RQIA from that inspection uh, process that they usually maintained actually to, to a support mechanism 
um, where we could use the profession, professional skills that uh, members of the RQIA had, should they be social workers, should they be nurses, where they could actually go in and advise and support care homes um, if they did present well, or they did find COVID-19 um, uh, positive patients or, or residents within their care homes. So there shouldn't be an issue at this moment in time where, where the independent sector, where care homes are having a problem with PPE, because I'm also aware that they've also set up um, a direct contact app where every independent care home or every care home um, has the ability to contact directly into RQIA should they have any concerns, should that be in regards to testing, support or PPE. So there should not be a case where a care home is still experiencing problems in obtaining PPE. If there is, I'm happy again to take uh, to have the conversation with the member outside the chamber and take the name of that care home to make sure we can get that addressed. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, the, uh, the Minister will be aware, I'm sure, that the countries that have been most successful in tackling the virus, countries like China, South Korea, Singapore and Japan, have used a combination of measures. So they've used widespread testing, rigorous uh, contact tracing, isolation and social distancing. However, uh, on the 12th of March, the British government took a clear policy decision to cease all contact tracing. And a similar policy decision was taken here, presumably by yourself, Minister. Now, these decisions uh, not only run counter to international best practice, but also run counter to advice given by the World Health Organization. So can the Minister tell us when he's going to reverse that decision and put in place a comprehensive programme of testing and rigorous contact tracing. Good. And again, in, in response to, to the member's question, I'll refer him to earlier on um, in the statement when I talked about how uh, we will be increasing our capacity of testing and how it's a, it's a drive and, and actually a target for my, just not myself, but for the executive as well. Uh, in regards to the contact tracing, when we move into the next phase, when we get through this surge, and we start to see where the virus is present uh, in our community, because that's the point where the contact tracing becomes a vital tool at the next step. Um, at this moment in time, we're working with colleagues with, through environmental health and, and all their agencies to make sure that they can get them trained up and skilled into what contact tracing actually is, because it's not just something you can throw anybody into because we want to make sure if we are going when we go into the next stage that does involve the contact tracing that the people that are doing it are fully skilled and realize the importance of doing that and that's why in, in the, the initial um, I suppose cases that we had we were able to utilize those highly skilled individuals that we had in the public health agency to do that contact tracing and it proved vital because if the member recalls back to you know our, our very first case um, which was of the individual who landed in Dublin airport and then travelled to the residence in Belfast. Through the Public Health Agency working with the HSE in the Republic of Ireland, we were able to contact, trace all the contacts that individual had from they got off the plane until they arrived home in Belfast. So it's a skill that isn't just as, as easy picked up as some may believe, but it's something that we're already working on. So when we come to the next phase of how we tackle COVID-19 within our community, we have people there ready to do that. So the, the member can be assured when it comes to the next, the next stage of how we manage and tackle COVID-19 within Northern Ireland, within the community, we will have the people in place to do that. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. And again, I would reassure him of our support and uh, his leadership to date on, on this very important issue. And I think, again, we should pay tribute to all the health professionals and the, the high level of, of care and it has been given out there to everyone throughout Northern Ireland. I think it's a good example. I think we're very fortunate. We're probably getting the best level of care that there is available in the world. And to date, there's been great success relating to that. Um, in relation, Mr Minister, to our GPs and the, the, um, the level of PPE that's been available to them, it is a matter that I've raised some time ago with yourself and uh, having been brought to my attention by a constituent, a GP, some weeks ago. Um, there is still some concern out there about the provision of PPE for GPs within their practice, and also uh, the use of an antibody test, 
which uh, I did forward that information to your, your office some time ago, where a local GP, and in fact a number of GPs, have sourced an antibody test costing £5 per test. And he was keen to get that uh, into the service. Could we have an update perhaps on that antibody test and the possibility of the use of it? Because the health professionals out there believe it would do a lot to reassure their staff and would uh, go a long way to ensuring that people are available to continue with the good work that they are carrying out. Okay, um, thank uh, the member again for his kind words of support for those, those working in the National Health Service. In, in regards to, to the antibody test, um, there are a number out there um, on the market, but there's none of them yet verified or certified. Um, for use. There's a national working group which is leading the work on the aspect of pan the pandemic re response. Um, that working group includes membership drawn from HSE England, Public Health England and the Med Medicines Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. All tests, and it's even the one the member refers to, all tests which may have potential for wider use in population testing are first triaged according to strict MHRA criteria. And if a test is successfully triaged, it will then be subject to further detailed work according to the nationally agreed processes and protocols. Staff from the HSC in Northern Ireland are well embedded across the work programme being led by the National Working Group and regular updates are provided to each meeting of the expert advisory group on testing. And it's envisaged that SHC staff will actively contribute to work progressing through that national programme and body. At this point, no suitable antibody test has been identified for use on a population basics, basis, uh, but I will continue to update uh, executive colleagues uh, as that national and assembly colleagues as that national local work progresses in this regard. Because what would actually be worse than no test is actually having a bad test. Because if, if this antibody test isn't as efficient in either its reproducibility or repetitivity, um, you can actually be telling somebody that they're clear when they're not. So in regards to the antibody test, I'd rather make sure it's right before we utilise it. In regards to PPE going to GPs, there was a major piece of work when the, the updated guidance was put out at the end of last week. Um, there was a major push uh, on PPE across the sector, uh, and, and including to GPs. So that should have completed um, this week as well. So I'd be surprised if there's GP practices out there that still don't have PPE kit. But one of the reasons we established the, the COVID centres was so that if anybody was phoning into a GP and being triaged at that point, that they were actually being directed, if necessary, to a COVID centre so they didn't have to present uh, specifically to a GP surgery. So that, that work's still ongoing. And again, if the member has specific GP surgeries, they still haven't supplied or need supply of PPE, you know, please get in contact. Members, we're halfway through questions, and we've only got the question uh, number nine now, so I could need your support. Succinct and focus. Call Kiva Archibald. I'm a good life, Ken Corlea, um, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement today, and like others, I would like to offer my condolences to those who have been bereaved and express my gratitude to our, all of our frontline workers. Um, Minister, you, you will likely be aware that myself and my party colleague Colin Gildon um, wrote to you last week about agency workers within the HSE and in particular their terms and conditions. And I would just like to ask if you would consider offering temporary con contracts to all agency staff on agenda for change terms and conditions to help provide stability during this crisis. And again, I thank the member. It is something that's been looked at in our workforce, but I think one of the, the many avenues of, I suppose, the upskilling and the up numbers, uh, the increase in numbers of our workforce that we have across the HSC sector, should it be from the volunteers that are coming in to support our HSC, but also those who are coming back into practice, um, should it be nurses, doctors, and also the number of student nurses we've brought forward, the number of general medical practitioners that we've brought forward in their training as well. So we're looking at every avenue to make sure we have the workforce in place. I haven't looked directly at bringing agency workers onto the payroll under Agenda for Change, but we're looking at every avenue to make sure that those who are working within our health service are receiving the best support um, that we can give them at this point in time. So it's not something I've ruled out, but it's not something that will be imminent within the next couple of days. So I don't want to mislead either the agency workers or the member herself. But when we look to to see again where the staff is uh, within our National Health Service and those supporting roles. Um, it's like when you get into war, 
When we go out, when any country goes into war, the most valued person they have is their, is, is their soldier in the front line. When we go in to tackle coronavirus, the most important person we have is those health workers. When people go into peacetime, they often forget their, their army and their volunteer. What we mustn't do is when we get through coronavirus, we must not forget the sacrifice and the dedication of our National Health Service. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And like others, I associate myself with comments. Um, uh, first of all, paying tribute again to our amazing healthcare staff and also um, offering condolences to the families and friends of those who have lost people in Northern Ireland to this awful virus. In answer to a previous question, the Minister said, the Minister noted that Northern Ireland's first case of COVID-19 arrived here via Dublin Airport. With that in mind, and given the Memorandum of Understanding last week, and given his, I think, acknowledgement that all island contact tracing is an inevitability, particularly in the context of now what is very low passenger transit between the islands of Britain and Ireland. When can we expect to see a joined up all island testing and tracing strategy brought forward by his department? Well, the member will be aware because he referred to the memorandum of understanding. And look, we do meet regularly, we do talk regularly with our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland, our chief medical officers. Are, are well intertwined, but one of the things that the member has to be conscious of, we, we, are, we are two jurisdictions that, that, that share this island, and why we do work closely together, and we will continue to work closely as we tackle COVID-19. It, it will be in a joint approach, but it will be a joint approach that is north, south and east, west. So when it comes to specific all-island all uh, approaches, all-island mechanisms, it is something that we will work in collaboration with our partners in the Republic of Ireland as we do with our partners across the United Kingdom. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Speaker, I thank the Minister uh, for his uh, comprehensive statement today. And I note that he referenced the noise coming from social media and some media commentators and others who recently appear to have become fully qualified scientists. It's unhelpful and it can cause disquiet in the minds of the public that the Minister is seeking to protect. It must be acknowledged that the Minister and his staff in the NHS and Associated Services have moved mountains over a short period of time. My question is, can he provide an update on the work being undertaken on COVID-19 research and development? Thank you. Uh, and again, um, you know, it, it was a point of comment in, in my statement because some of the noise that's generated out there is not just unhelpful, it's undermining to some of the key workers in our National Health Service. And it's, it's unfair that the commentary is often, often misguided and based on, on a tweet that somebody else has put out that isn't a real person to start with. In regards to how we look to, to the next phase, and that's actually the medical trials, um, there are a number of those ongoing where we will be looking to what medication may be useful in either reducing the, the veracity of of, of the virus are actually working as a, an antigen or a, a, a vaccine to prevent it actually entering, entering society as well. So the, the chief medical officer or, or chief medical officer here in Northern Ireland actually chairs that working group. So any, I suppose, trial of medication or um, vaccine that will be brought forward, the member can be reassured that Northern Ireland will be fully linked into any UK-wide approach. I called Gary Middleton. Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I join with others in thanking the Minister for the work that he is doing, uh, along with all of those uh, key workers on the front line who are uh, doing everything they can to save lives. Uh, Minister, this morning I spoke with a senior consultant within my own constituency who raised concerns like the ones that you have around people within our communities who have serious conditions, heart conditions, stroke, who are not attending their appointments, who are not going to the hospital, and ultimately that will lead to further complications, if not death. Uh, can you, Minister, reassure people that they do need to take with all ser seriousness those conditions, uh, whilst being mindful uh, of COVID-19, but they, they must not put their own health at risk and attend their appointments? And again, that's, I, I can't stress that enough, and it's a message, I think, that if, if, if anything that leaves here today, it's a message that must be reinforced. Um, in our society, in our community, that those who, who need to go to the GP, who need, need to go to an emergency department, should do so. 
because the GPs are now triaging, and again, if it's, if it's got COVID sent, then they're direct into the COVID-19 centre. If you're presenting it in an ED, most of our ED now have a dual track approach where those with COVID or respiratory conditions are treated separately from those who are experiencing either stroke or, or heart attack conditions. So what I would urge members of, of the general public in Northern Ireland, our health service is still here to serve you. It's our national health service, which is a free appointed delivery and free appointed use, and that's what it is there for. So please, if you do need to present with any medical condition, please do so, because we're still there to support you. As I said in my statement, in the preparation of the surge, the number of empty beds is a reassuring place to be, but it's also a place that I'm cognizant of as also meaning that maybe there should be more people in those beds utilising them that could be that aren't. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, uh, and thank the Minister for his statement and questions and answers thus far. Though I have to say that the two self-appointed experts that most concern me in this entire debate uh, are Boris Johnson and Donna Cummings and the influence they have had on the strategy around tackling COVID-19. And what I accept, as the Minister said earlier in his statement, that there will be time afterwards for a closer examination of all these things. But time and time again, the issue of PPE comes up. And the Minister in his address today has said to several members a question in relation to the independent sector. There should not be an issue. In response to another question about GPs, they should have the equipment. But time and time again, and night after night, we are given stories from reputable news agencies that frontline staff are seriously concerned about the level of personal protection equipment they have. Can the Minister redouble uh, his assurances and recheck again that the proper equipment is going out to frontline services? Because PPE covers a very broad range of issues, from gloves, aprons, to, to purpose-built masks. But can the Minister uh, redouble his efforts? And I know he's sincere in his efforts. I have no question about his sincerity in relation to these efforts whatsoever. But there's clearly a difference between what the Minister is able to inform the House and what the experience of some frontline staff is. No. And I, do, I, I, I thank the, the, the member for, for acknowledging the, the sincerity that we have, because I think it's a sincerity that is across my department, that is across our health service, and, and as I said in my statement, this is something the Chief Medical Officer come forward to me and has pushed to make sure that the, the correct PPE is getting out there. The supply of PPE is a challenge worldwide, but I don't want it to be a challenge of what's sitting in a stockpile, sitting in a warehouse and not getting to the person who needs it. But I will say as well that the regulation and the guidance that we put out there is to make sure that the PPE is used at the appropriate point in time by the people who need it at the right point in time. So, uh, to, give, to give the member, I, I suppose, uh, and he's right in regards to PPE covers a multitude of, of, of items and, and of issues. In the, last, in the last seven days, we have issued more than 12 million pieces of PPE. In 2019, our usually weekly distribution would have been just over 1 million. So, year on year, we have put out 12 million you know, we've put out 11 million more pieces of PPE. Um, I want to be assured, I need to be assured it's getting to the people who need it. So when I say to members in here, and all genuineness, if there is a care home, if there's a GP that's telling you they don't have that PPE, it should not be so. And that's why I've asked the Chief Medical Officer to put in a more stringent approach. We have seen a, an improvement over the past number of weeks where we had wards where we had nurses reporting running out in shortages on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning. We've worked on that. We've cracked that. GPs, we are getting a number of issues where there are a number of GP practices are saying we don't have it. We're working on that, and I believe we're cracking it. Care homes, in regards to the independent sector, you know, have a requirement that they're meant to procure their own PPE because they are independent, they are private suppliers. But we've made it very clear, as a health and social care system, we will support them in the obtainment of PPE, should it be access to our own stocks because it's important that we support the residents within their homes as well. So the member can be reassured I will do all I can. Should I have to, should I be working with the Chief Medical Officer to put a team in place that they have to go out and walk wards, walk GP surgeries, visit care homes to make sure that PP is in the right place, we'll do it. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I offer my condolences to families bereaved by COVID-19 and my thanks to health staff risking their own safety to limit the impact of this disease. 
It is clear that public compliance with coronavirus restrictions is also saving lives, but as the Minister acknowledges, this public health emergency also has the potential to cause anxiety and distress for many people. So can I ask the Minister if he would establish an emergency mental health assessment unit to receive urgent referrals for those suffering with mental illness during this time? I thank the member. And I Sorry, it's, it's one of those things that's discerning about this this committee of the House when I look down and see the member sitting in my chair. So, but, but what I will say to the member, in, in regards to, as, as I said earlier, in regards to stroke and to, to heart attack, those people who, who are suffering from, from the traumas for the mental health or from those anxieties should be looking to the same aspect uh, of support within our National Health Service because it's still there. It's still there to support them. Now, it may have been repurposed where we're taking telephone triages uh, more, more than face-to-face -face contact, but I'll, I'll reassure the member that that support mechanism should still be there for those who need it. Because what we also have to be cognizant of is, on the other side of this, and there will be another side to this, the level of mental health and anxiety and stress that we will see not just in, in society, but also in our health and social care workers will be immense. So we're already working within health, health services across trusts to make sure that mental health provision and wellbeing is already there for our staff, because there will be a point in time where where the pressures and the anxieties and the stress of the working environment that they're in, they will need that support, and we have to be there to provide it and offer it. I call Mervyn's story. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for the update to the House? I'd also thank him uh, for the information that he's given to us. And can I share uh, the sympathy that has been expressed, not only to those families today who have suffered as a result of the passing of a loved one, through COVID-19, but also to those families, some uh, neighbours of our own today who have had to bury loved ones uh, in circumstances uh, that are uh, very difficult and very challenging, given the restrictions and all that has to be put in place. So our thoughts and prayers are with all of those who have lost loved ones at this time. Can I welcome his uh, comments, particularly in regards to pharmacists and uh, the money that he's also released to community pharmacy recently and he knows that this is an issue which we have raised with him previously uh, and also the comment that he made about not forgetting after this can, our, can the member come to question our uh, national health service that community pharmacists are not forgotten you will be aware minister that there were changes made to the operation at the causeway hospital in Coleraine, particularly in relation to icu and to maternity services this is not a keyboard warrior that has I have been speaking to or any of those individuals on social media, but a retired consultant uh, from the Causeway who I've spoken to in the last 24 hours, who's expressed grave concern about ensuring that these are only temporary measures and that they will not be used as long-term decisions in regards to undermining the long-term viability of the Causeway Hospital. Okay. Uh, in regards to, to the comment, the member will be aware, because uh, I brought a copy of it, because I knew it would probably be raised today, of the, the press release or the reassurance that was actually issued by, by the Northern Health, and, um, Northern Health and Social Care Trust, which restated this as a temporary arrangement and reflects the limited anaesthetic medical and ICE nursing workforce in Causeway and the fact that other hospitals, such as Antimaria Hospital, have been specifically set up to deal with such cases. So I think in regards to the concern that was raised and was raised uh, on social media, you know, the Northern Trust moved themselves to, re to reassure members. But his point, uh, his opening comments in regards to the perception and how we treat death in Northern Ireland. How, how we look to death in Northern Ireland has always been a very personal, a very family, a very community-based experience. It's how we come together um, as a community to provide support to the families of those bereaved and also to make sure that they're aware of the support that continues to be there. So where we are today, when we go, don't get the chance of that, that closure, when we go, don't get, for, for those members who lose their lives to COVID-19, where the family member doesn't get to hold their hand at that final moment, that is a challenge that that, that we're working on, I suppose, the, the challenge that comes with an ICU and, and the toll it takes on the nurses, I, you know, and it, it gives me 
That reassurance and pride in our nursing workforce when they can put out a message to the families of those loved ones that your family member did not die alone. We were there. Now, that's a big onus to ask for any individual, but I think it's also a reassurance to those families who couldn't be there at that final moment to know that the dedication and the love of our health staff is there to support them. In regards to community pharmacy, um, I can't stress enough uh, my thanks to and appreciation to how much they have stepped up because the work that they have done in the past number of um, weeks has been immense. Now it has taken, you know, they've also brought in opening challenges, changes to their opening hours, but the pressure and number of prescriptions they're putting out. So they've done a, an invaluable piece of work in supporting, um, in supporting the health service and being part, as I said when I last met them, that they were part of the health family and that's how they're perceived and that's how they should be treated. I call M Melissa McEwen. I would last concur as to Melissa, not Melissa. <laughs> Uh, and again, uh, I, Minister, thank you for your statement as well. Too. And I know that you don't like to talk about statistics and that, but one statistic that jumped out today, even when they talked about New Zealand and the strategies that they adopted there, is that one is three times more likely to die of coronavirus in Britain than they are on the island of Ireland. I think there's food for thought on there as well, too, and one should consider that when looking at strategies. Uh, but uh, above that, uh, Minister, there's 5,566 receivers of direct payment for care. Now, how do those workers who are technically employees for care uh, access PPEs and testing? Now, with the recent guidelines published on the 9th of April, there is a feeling uh, that those workers have effectively been abandoned. I assure the member that the vote we are putting in support measures for, for those families, those, those members who are look, looking after their own loved one and have taken that direct care as well. So the supply and the support will be there and further guidance will be issued as to how they can access that as well. Uh, in regards to, 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 to comparing uh, one nation's death rate with another, uh, as I said earlier, I, I will not get there. I will not go into that level of of analysis at this point in time, because we do not know where we will finish. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today uh, and the additional uh, information that you have shared with us. I suppose before uh, this crisis, our social care was in dire straits anyway. Our community care and our home care were, were in difficulties. Uh, and now we see even greater pressure being put on them. Um, my question uh, to you, I've had occasion um, over the weekend to, to speak to quite a number of um, our, our, our uh, home care uh, and, and community care teams, and, and they are confused in relation to the guidance, in relation to PPE. They don't believe that they have sufficient uh, PPE and they think that the guidance coming out from P uh, PHA and RQIA and the trusts in many ways are conflicting uh, and, and they believe that it, the ch it changes rapidly. What is appropriate and what is correct one day is maybe not appropriate and correct the next day. And as one of, uh, one of the doctors in, in one of the care homes said to me, it's like the parent that goes into the cupboard to see what they're going to have for dinner. They open the cupboard and they say, this is what we're having for dinner today because that's what's in the cupboard. So, you know, PPE can't be distributed on that manner. People can, are feeling confused the question, and don't please? feel confident. So can we have some joined up approach between uh, the various uh, clinical bodies and, uh, and organisations to make sure that the, the, the right PPE is in the right place at the right time uh, for, for the right uh, cares? Thank you. And again, I think that's, that's the reassurance um, I have given because when it, when it comes to those in the community care and, and those in social care, um, it's often those within our health service, it's often those who are least noticed that we now most value, and especially that's where we're finding ourselves in regards to, the, to those workers in, at this moment in time. In regards to the guidance, um, I, 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 I'm not going to take exception of what, of what the member said because the, the current guidance that we're working on um, is an agreed set of guidance that was brought together not by trusts, not by the PHA, 
but was brought together by the chief medical officers of all four nations, the chief nursing officers of all four, all four nations, supported by the Royal College of Nurses, the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of GPs. You know, so the, the guidance that we currently have um, in regards to what member or what members of our, our health service should be wearing at particular times is guidance that was brought forward um, with consultation and working with with all those organisations and is also based around the principles of the World Health Organization and what we see as development PPE standards um, across the world. So the guidance, um, I, I don't believe, has changed that often. That has changed o over a week ago, which actually made PPE more accessible to those people um, who, who wanted to use it in different circumstances. So it's about the clarity of how that information is maybe being cascaded um, down through your independent and private providers, that maybe is where the challenge is, is, and that's something that our chief nursing officer has worked to address with a number of online um, seminars and demonstrations as to what PPE has been used in different, de or should be used in different locations. There was also a, a tick box exercise as to where what PPE should be used in each setting as well. But you no, know, we, we will look to make sure that 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 information and guidance is being cascaded down in a manner and a method that can be easily understood. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your statement. I just want to take a look a little bit further and ask you what support you've put in guidance for those ones, those particular people that have lost loved ones through COVID-19 uh, and have not had the chance to say goodbye or to grieve properly. I suppose what I will say to the member, you know, there, there's, there is, you know, there, there's bereavement guidance and support organisations out there because this is a, it's a very challenging time for anyone who loses a loved one to COVID-19 who isn't able to be there in those final moments. But again, it goes back to, to what I said to, to Marvin's story as well. It's the challenge that how we perceive death over, over this period, I think, will be challenging for many because they will, will miss that final part of closure. Um, that they often get when they see a family or, or a member, um, pa pa a loved one pass away. So it's making sure that the support mechanisms are there through the bereavement council, through through other supports, through churches, through community groups, through faith-based organisations. That there is there is a support there as well, because due to social isolation, you know, the wake, the visiting to the house, all that is traditional um, part of bereave or part of grieving. In Northern Ireland, doesn't happen at this moment in time. So, it's not just where members lose a loved one; they're not getting that support that they often get through the network of family members and of local community. So, it's important that, that as a community, we come together to support those individuals who lose ones, not just not just from COVID-19, but through other natural methods or other medical conditions as well. That we, we make a special part of, of supporting them and a, a special effort to support those individuals at this moment in time. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I read with interest in the Minister's statement his comments on social distance restrictions. And when he says there can be no ground whatsoever for complacency, he's of course right. And that the focus has to be on staying at home. Of course, he's right again. So, Minister, why then are women still being told to travel up to two to three day journeys to access abortion services during this COVID lockdown? And why can't the trusts here, who have begun an EMA service of their own bats with no support or direction or funding from either you or your department, still not allowed to prescribe from home to reduce travel here, just like we have done right across elsewhere in these islands? Uh, the member will know that abortion and termination in Northern Ireland is a controversial issue, and as such, I, I referred the matter to the executive over a week ago. I'm aware that there are some trusts who are performing EMA. They have been um, I, I, they have been written to by the chief medical officer in regards to the requirements that they should be following in regards to the regulations that was put out um, by the Northern Ireland office at the end of last month. Regulations that were not um, widely consulted on by members of this House are brought forward by this House, but were brought forward by the Northern Ireland Office. And that is where 
unfortunately, that is where that service and that, that delivery now, now remains, uh, and it remains a controversial and uh, contested issue in Northern Ireland. But there, I'm aware there are trusts who are performing and supporting women who need it at this minute in time. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, could I commend the Minister and the health workers that he represents for the sterling efforts to contain and deal with this crisis? Could I particularly commend him for our not shrinking from the necessary resort to military aid, even though, of course, it provoked the predictable and scurrilous attack upon him again by the Deputy First Minister, who once more put politics before saving lives. But could I ask him in particular about this much speculated Chinese order? Is there such an order or will there be such an order? And how does the concerns that were raised by a senior official over a week ago about the, the unreliability of the potential product, given that 35% of Chinese product has not been suitable, where do those concerns now stand, uh, and could he give us an update in respect of that? What I will, um, what I will say to the member in, in regards to his opening comments, um, I'm not going to be distracted in any shape or form from the work that I have to do as health minister, and because I have a duty to the, to the people of Northern Ireland to make sure that we get, we get through, this, um, through this crisis and this virus as well as we can. And, and you know, to quote the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Gubras, please don't politicize the virus. It exploits the differences you have at a national level. If you want to be exploited and you want to have many more body bags, then you don't do it. So that was in his response to I spent Donald Trump and, and his, but I think it's right that we don't politicize. Um, this virus and how we react to it in Northern Ireland. And specifically in regards to, to the PPE, uh, in regards to the order from China or wherever else, the member will be very clear from my statement, I will accept PPE and will get PPE from wherever we need it at this moment in time. The UK policy on PPE is working on three pillars, as they talk about. It's the international, which includes our supply from China. It's the, the national, which is our support from the United Kingdom, and it's the local as well, where we look to local local manufacturers. In regards to the quality of the, the consignment coming from China, the current um, procurement route that we're using and the Department of Finance is utilising at this minute in time is embedded with the British Embassy in China. So that's the avenue that we're working also to, in, in conjunction um, with the UK government and the other four nations uh, to secure that supply of PPE and to ensure that the quality is of what we require. I call Jerry Carroll. Mr. Speaker, I want to share some concerns um, raised with me about our care homes, but before I do, I want to give my sympathies with everybody who's died from the virus, uh, in particular those in care homes, particularly in my own constituency in the uh, Our Ladies Care Home in the, in the Beachmount area. Um, and we have to ask, uh, Mr. Speaker, what message does it send out that the, the Health Department, the Minister's Department, didn't uh, add the numbers of people who died in care homes to the official register for weeks? Uh, people were likely passing away in our care homes, and the department didn't see fit uh, to add their names to the official deaths register. This implied uh, that these lives were not worth counting alongside everybody else who have died from this disease, a deeply disturbing development in this crisis. And we've heard far, from far and away from care home providers, staff and family members uh, of situations where current providers and staff are ill-equipped with uh, not enough or inadequate uh, PPE. On top of this, we're now being told that a multi-million pound offer coming in of equipment and a large section of it may be faulty. Uh, does the department not have the basic capacity to check this equipment before it comes in? And it truly reflects a uh, shambolic situation uh, we're, we're in at the minute. Uh, just to come to my, my question. Uh, one former public health official, uh, John Ashton, has suggested the real figure of deaths could be twice as many as the official figure uh, touted by the UK government, uh, because uh, deaths in care homes are not counted as part of the official figures. Does the executive and the minister take the view that many old people will be collateral damage in this health pandemic? I personally take great exception of what the member has just accused me and my department of doing. 
because I can assure them we care. I can assure them I care because I can assure the members there's nights I don't sleep when I think about what we're doing and what we have to do the next day. When he talks about not caring for those members who are in a care home, does he honestly believe that I, or members in this house, or members in my department, don't have people and family members in those care homes? So how dare you? How dare you accuse us of not caring? Because I can assure you that our department, my department, and my officials care as much about every citizen, every individual in Northern Ireland as we do anybody else. So in regards to, to the numbers, the member is well aware, because there was a statement issued yesterday. In regards to those, those individuals who are recorded by the Public Health Agency, they are the members who have been tested and pass away in hospital and have been tested in the last 28 days. NISRA is responsible for the statistics of those deaths who are recorded through uh, death certificates. Now, there is a time delay and a lag in recording of those. So that information has been brought forward, and that was done on the 3rd of this month. This week's uh, NISRA statistic and bulletin will show where those people have died. Should have been in hospital facilities or should have been in care home settings as well. So don't ever accuse us or this department for not caring for those individuals who are in care homes, because we do. And what I will also say, say to the member as well, in regards to, to the care home he actually did name, um, I think from reading the front page of the Irish News today, that a number of those deaths that were recorded in that care home had actually um, either passed away or had been in the hospital facility within the past 28 days and had been tested for coronavirus. So they would have been part of the PHA report as well as the NISRA report. So that's all I say to the member in this case. And that concludes questions on the Minister's statement. We shall now have a brief suspension of five minutes prior to the next statement from the Economy Minister. And I would remind all members about the importance of maintaining social distancing when leaving or indeed entering the chamber during the suspension. Uh, so I would ask you all to please do so via the, your nearest door. Uh, the meeting uh, will resume in five minutes. The meeting has now resumed, and item three on the agenda is a statement from the Economy Minister. The Speaker received notification on the 10th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your table packed at page three. I'd like to welcome the Minister for the economy to this meeting of the committee. I invite the Minister to make a, a statement which should be heard without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to bring members up to, debate, up to date on my department's response to the COVID-19 crisis. The daily death toll from this virus is horrendous. My thoughts first and foremost are with grieving families across Northern Ireland, people currently in hospital or ill at home, and the NHS staff who are working to save lives daily. The biggest health emergency Northern Ireland has ever faced has also created an unprecedented economic crisis. As economy minister, my role right now is to try and mitigate the worst impacts on our economy by protecting as many livelihoods as possible. By doing this, I believe we will safeguard the economic foundations on which recovery must be built. This is why we are working to distribute over 400 million in support packages to businesses right across Northern Ireland. This is why I am in near daily contact with ministers in Westminster working on behalf of businesses, large and small, on behalf of sectors including manufacturing, tourism, construction, aviation and haulage, on behalf of workers and self-employed. The need to prepare the local economy to a return to normality at some point is the driving force behind the work we do to help furloughed or redundant workers retrain or find work in the sectors where they are needed most. 
It is my priority to do everything in my power to try and protect jobs, safeguard supply chains and sustain businesses. However, let us be in no doubt about the scale of this task. COVID-19 has brought to a halt a significant portion of global economic activity. Exporting and importing have become more difficult. Supply chains are significantly disrupted and international travel has all but ceased. A whole swathe of industries have had to close down to wait out the crisis. Others are dealing with dramatically reduced orders and sales. Our tur tourism industry collapsed overnight and businesses are dealing with crippling uncertainty. We will be dealing with the economic aftershocks for a long time to come. And make no mistake, all sectors of the economy will be affected. Economists, both within my department and externally, are anticipating significant falls in GDP during quarter two of this year, while holding out some hope for a rebound later in the year. A small number of companies remain open with strict social distancing measures in place. Others, like the retail and health sectors, have stepped forward and even expanded to play a crucial role in supporting the effort to tackle COVID-19. In the darkest of times, I have seen the best of business. Companies have repurposed production lines. Workers have volunteered to help whenever they can. Staff facing layoff have asked how they can use their skills to fill gaps created by sickness. Others have offered support in sourcing and importing vital resources. However, I am acutely aware of the hardship facing many business owners and workers. We are rolling out grants to some of our most severely affected businesses. As far as I am aware, this is the largest financial package ever to be made to local businesses. These schemes, which in normal circumstances would take months to put in place, are being delivered in a fraction of that time. And I do want to go on record and state my appreciation for the work of the officials in my department, as well as the Department of Finance, in getting to this stage. The first payments under the Small Business Grant Scheme were made nine days after the original announcement. Since then, nearly 15,000 businesses have received the 10,000 grants, totalling around 150 million. I know from speaking to owners that these payments are helping businesses to survive, to pay their staff and to plan for the future. This scheme has now been extended to include small industrial businesses that qualify for industrial day rating. This expansion will cover around 2,500 additional businesses. The Executive has also agreed the 25,000 grant scheme, which will open on the 20th of April. It will be crucial to our hospitality, tourism, leisure and retail sectors which have been hit particularly badly. Over 4,000 businesses, many of which were among, to take, among the first to take the hit from the crisis, will benefit. Businesses will be required to apply for this scheme, and I would encourage those who consider themselves eligible to apply as soon as we open for applications. We aim to make the process as easy as possible, and in order to achieve this, the Department of Finance officials have advised that the portal will be fully operable by the 20th of April. I can assure businesses that as soon as applications have been verified, the grant will be paid. We will not be waiting until the end of the application process before making the payments. The scheme will run over the next month and will deliver funds to ease cash flow problems as some of our hardest hit businesses. The Executive has committed to providing a three months rates holidays to all businesses from April to June. It is my view that this is one of the most effective ways to support the sustainability of the wider economy and I believe should be extended further. For many companies, rates are a huge outlay and it would make a positive contribution if the Northern Ireland Executive was able to match other parts of the United Kingdom in this respect. The UK-wide job retention scheme, which I lobbied long and hard for, allows businesses to keep people on their payroll by providing up to 2,500 uh, 2, a month for furloughed employees. 
Self-employed workers can also receive 80% of their taxable profit over the last three years, capped at 2,500 per month. This applies to those with trading profits below 50,000. These are critical measures which are providing support to tens of thousands of businesses and workers across Northern Ireland. However, I am also acutely aware that uh, there are others um, who are facing financial hardship that are not able as yet to access any of the existing national or regional grant schemes. And we are currently working out how best to assist them. At its meeting on the 10th of April, the executive agreed the need for a further scheme. A budget has been identified um, and we are currently examining the ways in which this money uh, can be delivered. We will look to fill the gaps for businesses that are already uh, not receiving funding. Increases to working tax credit and universal credit by £1,000 per year will help the most vulnerable. The Coronavirus Business Inter Interruption Loan Scheme is a further tool um, and a, should be a crucial step in getting cash flow to firms in uh, this difficult uh, period. Our national government has taken a huge amount of public borrowing uh, to support the economy in the short term. It is important that the support provided both nationally and by the executive is deployed to limit job losses so that come the recovery, workers can come off furlough and back into the workplace. As the impact of the crisis bites deeper, assistance will need to be targeted to those who need it most. The shutdown of many industries in Northern Ireland, the collapse and footfall around our towns and cities, and emerging survey evidence all indicate that the reality is that there has been widespread furloughing of workers by many firms. InvestNI client companies have notified it that over 30,000 jobs have been furloughed. Outside of InvestNI's client base, many more will have been furloughed too. However, it is worth noting that we have seen many examples of large-scale furloughing of workers by firms, but what we are not seeing as yet uh, are examples of large-scale redundancies. In assessing all the available economic indicators and data, my department's economists fear that the number of workers in Northern Ireland directly impacted by the shutdown could well go beyond 200,000, with widespread job losses too, potentially as many as 25,000 in the short term. Outside of the labour market, their analysis also suggests that house prices look to be set to be negatively impacted and trade and investment appear set to stall. However, while this analysis is based on assumptions and indicators which can and do change, we can say with certainty that the economic impact is set to be deep and far-reaching, and many across Northern Ireland will need ongoing support. The latest information on every support scheme currently available to businesses can be found at uh, NI Business Info website. There has also been significant pressure on the aviation industry, haulage and ferry companies, which has led to a dramatic reduction in our air and sea connectivity. This is a very important issue, which I continue to raise with government ministers in London. In respect of Northern Ireland's vital air connectivity with Great Britain, my officials, alongside those from Finance and Infrastructure, are working with the UK's Department for Transport to provide support to maintain Northern Ireland air connectivity during this COVID-19 crisis period. Indeed, Ministers Mallon, Murphy and I wrote yesterday to the UK Chancellor in support of the Department for Trade business case, seeking UK government support to maintain strong air links here between here and GB. I am hopeful that this intervention will realise a support package. Aviation will also have an important role to play in the recovery of our tourism industry. I am conscious that the tourism and hospitality sector was one of the first sectors to experience the impact of COVID-19. I want to thank those who are on the front line and working in vital industries such as food, manufacturing, telecoms and retail. Our energy supply has remained constant throughout this crisis, 
turning on the heat, flicking a light switch and cooking a meal are all made possible by the thousands of energy workers who are, make, who are making sure that everyone has the energy they require. I am planning to speak to Mr Quarteng uh, about the energy, how the energy system is coping across the UK and my department is maintaining solid communication at all levels with the system locally. I know that generators, network operators, suppliers and those representing consumer interests have all stepped forward in recent weeks to ensure that people's needs are met and I want also to take the opportunity to thank them. The safety of workers must remain an absolute priority. If people can work at home, they should. But for those who cannot, the work environment should be safe and follow the public health guidance. In response to some concerns raised, the Stakeholder Engagement Forum was convened, comprising unions and business groups. It has provided advice on priority business sectors and codes of practice which I will bring to the Executive on Friday. We already have examples of successful social distancing at work where production lines have been extended, break times staggered, canteen tables restricted to one per person, and increased cleaning and physical measures such as Perspex panels to minimise contact have been introduced. We will make sure that this good work continues and I will do everything in, within my power to ensure that we have a safe workforce working with industry will save lives. Our economy is changing very significantly, leading to a change in direction for many businesses. However, we know that improving the digital skills of our workforce will enhance our competitiveness and increase productivity in the long term. I also believe that investing in digital skills provides an opportunity to reinforce our competitive advantage in areas such as cybersecurity, data analytics and robotics. So I want to provide individuals, particularly those who are furloughed, with the opportunity to improve their digital skills. To begin the process, we intend to provide a range of online digital courses via our careers portal. These courses will be free for everyone and provide an opportunity for individuals to use their time at home to prepare for the future. My department is also helping people seeking alternative employment. Our careers advisors are supporting people in matching their skills and experiences to opportunities in demand, including full-time, part-time and temporary roles. There is high demand in sectors such as health, retail and agri-food. Our universities and colleges have been forced to close their doors for face-to-face -face learning, but they have remained active in the fight against COVID-19. Students and staff at our um, higher and further education institutions have been providing and creating personal protective equipment, joining the research for a vaccine and volunteering and joining the health service workforce. I am acutely aware that the stopping of face-to-face -face teaching has had a particular impact on how vocational qualifications will be awarded. I have instructed my officials to work with SIA and other regulators as a matter of urgency to identify the fairest way of issuing grades. I am aware that the downturn in the hospitality sector will have had an impact on students who often work in that sector. With this in mind, I have requested an extension to increased student hardship funds as we move into the third semester. I hope uh, that this can be doubled and I will be discussing this with executive colleagues. Those students have stepped up and I want to thank them for that. In the severest of times when our resilience is being tested, I cannot promise that every job or every business will be saved because I think this crisis will leave no one unscathed. But I will do all I can to counteract the severest impacts and protect the livelihoods which support families and communities in Northern Ireland. We will get through this and when we do, I believe the measures we have put in place will form the foundations on which our businesses can build our economic recovery. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her statement. And there will now be a period of around an hour for which members will be able to ask questions. 
uh, and it's my intention to allow all members to ask the question. But again, that will, I will need your cooperation that those asking questions will be focused and succinct. Members may ask only one question, and it must be related to the statement. The Chair of the Committee for the Economy will be allowed some latitude and allowed to ask an additional question. Uh, <coughs> I now call on Kiva Archibald, Chair of the Economy Committee. Good morning, um, and I'd like to, to thank the, the Minister for her statement and, uh, as she has outlined, um, the economic impact and the impact on um, local business is severe and it's beginning to be shown through, through business surveys. Cash flow in particular is an issue um, and um, you have addressed this somewhat in your, your statement, but the announcement over the weekend of the, the £25,000 grant um, and the potential for it to take three weeks to administer um, caused anxiety and distress to, to, to many in those sectors. Um, I had written to you on this over the weekend and I have spoken to, to you about it this morning also. Um, and you addressed it somewhat in your statement when you said, as applications are verified, the grant will be paid. Um, I would just like to ask you to expand a little bit on how we can ensure that this money is going to get to businesses as quickly as possible. Um, I very much welcome the, the news about the student hardship support. The Minister will know that that is something that, that I ha have pushed for, and I think that it is very welcome. Um, I would also just ask that you would look at how we would support um, students who do not go to university here in, in the north. And, and finally, just my, my, my second question it would be in relation to um, those not covered by the current schemes, um, for example, our very innovative and bright, uh, vibrant social enterprise sector, where we have a number of businesses doing really important work, and the charitable sector also, sole traders. Um, can you maybe outline what is being planned to support those working in those sectors? Um, thank you, um, and thank you, um, as Chair of the Committee, for the continuous cooperation um, and work um, that we do together on, on the very important issues um, that um, impact uh, on all of our lives. In relation to the £25,000 um, grants, um, these grants are now going to be available um, to those in retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure. So that is an important expansion of uh, where the grant uh, is now going um, from where the, the original intention was. And there has been quite a bit of work done to try to get those additional companies included uh, in that sector. Um, as you are aware, um, for the small business, uh, the, the 10K grants to those who qualify for small business rate relief, for those who qualify for those um, who are small manufacturing companies. Um, there is already a financial process around them. They are easily identifiable in the system. We've been able to work very well with finance to make sure that those companies are identified quite quickly. And, that, um, and we've been able to pay out very quickly on those uh, grants. 25K grant is slightly different in that we had to create a process around it. Um, and uh, that took some time in looking at all of the databases. I had originally hoped that this grant would um, be live today, um, but that has been delayed um, just for a few days until the 20th um, because we need, uh, or the Department of Finance need uh, to make sure that the web portal um, is uh, fully functioning and will provide those who are applying for the grant with a fairly seamless operation um, when they are applying. So um, at the request of the Department of Finance, we have delayed the introduction just for a few days. However, I was talking to the department today and I was talking to the minister today, and we have agreed that if we can bring this forward even by a day, that we will do that in order to get it out as quickly as possible. This is not a, a, something that's in anyone's interest to delay it in any shape or form. In uh, respect of the application, there will be an online application process, very simple process, but it does give uh, comfort and financial comfort uh, around the process. Um, and as soon as we are able to verify that application, then we will pay it in exactly the same way as we paid uh, the smaller 10K grants, so as quickly as possible. And I do want to acknowledge uh, the work put in by my officials and Department of Finance officials in creating a scheme and creating a payment system 
um, in a very short period of time. Um, I, uh, every week, for the benefit of other members in the House, uh, the Chair of the Committee and I have a, a bit of a catch-up um, on all of the issues that uh, rumble around uh, the, 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 the committee. Um, and uh, I did undertake to look at those students who do not go to university in Northern Ireland, um, but who still um, are subject to universities who maybe in England or Scotland, Wales, um, who are still continuing to ask those students to pay for uh, accommodation in the third term when they're not here. And I will undertake to look at that, although I suspect it is up to the university and the particular hardship schemes that the university introduced. But I will look at that. For our part here in Northern Ireland, we will continue for students to pay grants and our loans into uh, the third term. And uh, in order to try to address that issue of hardship, um, we have also um, asked the executive for support to increase the amount of money that is available um, to each university in their student hardship fund. Each university has a, a separate student hardship fund. It's directed at those who um, are in financial difficulties, particularly those with disabilities, lone parents, um, those who, who find it more difficult within the system. Um, and I would really like um, to get the support of the executive um, to double that so that we would have a substantial amount of money in that fund in each university. I don't want to create a new process. I have tried to uh, stick with the process that is there um, and not try to reinvent the wheel in a difficult situation. To those uh, businesses that have not yet been identified, including those in the social enterprise sector, um, we are looking at how we can offer help uh, to those uh, businesses. And I hope to be in a position uh, to make uh, a further announcement on grants reasonably soon. Um, for those in the charitable sector, the finance minister just updated us today that as a, con as a Barnet consequential of the money that was announced uh, for the charity sector, um, there will be additional money coming to Northern Ireland for uh, Northern Ireland charities and also, um, as far as I'm aware, not to steal anyone's thunder, um, for charities like the hospice and so on, which really is valuable and which has seen a huge decline in the amount of money that people are able to raise uh, for, for those particular good causes. So um, that I think all of those are in the system and will, will be working their way through. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statement uh, today. Uh, Minister, on Friday, uh, I took part on, in a Q&A MLA session uh, via video link with uh, the London Chamber of Commerce and uh, a number of their members. Uh, one of the key issues that came out of that was around the uh, essential and non-essential workers, and I appreciate that an engagement forum has been set up uh, to look at this. Uh, can the Minister give any clarity as to when that would be available, uh, and given the fact that there's now an extension of the current um, restriction measures for, for three weeks. I think it's important that we do have that clarity uh, for the businesses. Yes, thank you. I think that that is um, really um, essential and, and really clear. And I'm glad that you're conducting all of your business online too. Um, uh, it seems quite strange that we're conducting uh, conversations with, with ministers right across the United Kingdom uh, with uh, Zoom. <laughs> at every opportunity. Um, in terms of the engagement forum, first of all, I'll take the opportunity in this House to uh, congratulate those people who have spent their time in the engagement forum, uh, both the trade unions and the businesses who have come together to do what is important work. Um, the, there will be a paper going to the executive um, on Friday, um, which will update them and ask them to make decisions on the work uh, of the engagement forum. I can tell the House that the engagement forum have produced two uh, pieces of work. One is a code of practice agreed between unions and businesses around safe working practices. And this is really um, a very valuable tool for us going forward. One of the things um, I talk about often in executive meetings and with officials is 
um, the road, the path back to recovery and, and the gentle steps that we will have to take to ease ourselves um, back into recovery and, and, and into full work mode. I believe that social distancing will be with us for a considerable period of time and, those, um, and that continuing engagement of the forum along with the health and safety executive, the public health agency and so on and that piece of work I think will be a very valuable contribution to that. Um, they have also produced um, a, a further piece of work around essential and non-essential workers, which I will present to the executive and take their view on, um, and I'm sure that there will be a, a publication of that reasonably soon thereafter. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. It is very welcome. And can I say from the outset um, that all the schemes that you have outlined have been very, very welcomed by the business community. Um, I suppose the, the biggest complaint that we're getting is, um, is to get that cash as quickly as possible into the business uh, accounts, uh, and that's where the difficulty therein lies. Uh, I suppose, you know, if you look at the 25K uh, scheme, Scotland is already administering that, and we're, we haven't got to that part yet, uh, and cash is keen for those businesses. Um, also, um, in, in, a lot of businesses felt that they Can have been question? vilified um, because uh, they were operating and working, and I think it's great to hear the Minister uh, welcome those businesses that have repurposed, and it's important to say that as well. But what I would like maybe a little bit, bit more clarity on the self-employment um, support coming forward and can that be speeded up as well because we have a lot of small um, entrepreneurs that are actually not going to get any cash until maybe later on in June. So can she give us a wee bit more detail on that scheme as well? Can I say thank you um, to the member for the question and also um, for the comments around uh, the businesses. I am acutely aware of the need for cash flow. I am acutely aware uh, that many businesses face um, dire uh, circumstances. People who have spent their lifetime building a business um, are, are, are in significant difficulty through absolutely no fault of their own. Um, and I think it is uh, important, and we will endeavour to get the 25K scheme as quickly as is possible out um, into the uh, community and into the business community. Um, I would also make the comment about cash flow. And um, one of the things that um, we have been able to do um, with uh, our government in, in London is to keep a constant flow of contact um, through uh, various groups. So I um, dial in every week. Tomorrow I will be dialing in to the economic response um, group, and that is chaired by the Chancellor. So we have a very, very good and open channel of communication to bring these issues forward because, of course, both the job retention scheme and the scheme for the self-employed is a matter um, for national government and uh, for Her Majesty's Treasury. So I will bring some of these issues again forward, and I have written to him about these. So the two things um, that I think are, are absolutely massive and pertinent to your question is the issue of getting money from the job retention scheme for those furloughed workers to companies as quickly as possible. We are told, or we were told by the Chancellor on our last call, that this scheme and this web portal would open on the 20th um, with payment to be made uh, thereafter. And almost without exception, uh, many of the people on the call made the point um, that money needed to flow fairly quickly for those furloughed workers because that's what people were depending on to run their April um, payroll. So that, that point has already been made. In terms of those who are self-employed, two particular things come up over and over again. One is the length of time that the scheme is taking um, to actually get implemented, um, to which the Chancellor invariably will reply, and I'm, I'm just quoting him, I'm not actually advocating for him, but he will invariably reply um, that we are, you know, 
doing huge schemes on an unimaginable scale in a very, very short period of time. But that doesn't help that self-employed person who has uh, lost their business outlets, um, again, through no fault of their own. So the time scale is really important. Um, <coughs> but the other issue that comes up over and over again is the issue of those people who became self-employed in the last tax year. And it is worth noting that I have made a representation for those people because they haven't had time to file a tax return. They can't fill uh, the qualifying of the three-year averaging that the, the scheme actually uh, asks for. And we have made specific representation on behalf of those people. Because many of those people, I mean, I think of some of the people who've written to me and really heartbreaking stories. Um, where people have you know, invested, signed up for leasing of equipment and so on, and invested really their life savings in a new venture, in a new self-employed venture, um, and have been met with this. But th yet their help um, at the moment is universal credit, and that is deeply damaging to the economy, to entrepreneurs, uh, and, and to what we want to encourage for all of our businesses. I call John Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And thank you very much to the Minister for her statement. As usual, it raises more questions than answers. Um, and sadly, I'm only allowed one today. And I appreciate I have, as you probably know, asked a number in recent weeks through the form of that letter. And if you could come back to me on that, Minister, I'd really appreciate it just on those issues. Um, as you'll, you said, the government interventions to date have been substantial, to say the least. But there are still 50% of companies in Northern Ireland who are entitled to nothing. And of those companies that are entitled to a grant, less than half have already got it. And I do think it is important that we get that out there as quickly as possible. Cash is king. And there are businesses I'm speaking to every day who literally have days or weeks to go. Um, to get to my question then, I do think we need to do more. We need to get more money to these companies. And would you give an undertaking to maybe look at a bespoke version of the Welsh Economic Resilience Model that they launched at the end of March, with £500 million being put into that, with grants of up to £100,000 for companies to access that? Because we are staring into an economic abyss, Minister. As we know, it's a health crisis now, but it's going to become the biggest economic crisis in history. And we do need to do whatever we can. Thank you. Um, again, can I thank the member for his question, um, and uh, it again uh, is, is a very, very important one, um, and one uh, which um, I have been working on. Um, we have been concentrating on getting the grant packages out, uh, on helping companies with some of the difficulties they're having via the loan scheme, which again can be quite considerable, um, and in uh, addressing um, issues um, to the two, um, the self-employed and the job retention scheme. But we will be turning our mind to the issue of recovery. Um, and um, the Welsh um, Resilience Fund provides one model of how we can do that. Invest and I have been asked uh, to look at the particular schemes and measures that we will need to help the Northern Ireland economy in uh, its recovery uh, package. And I will be going to the Northern Ireland Executive and asking for a considerable investment in Northern Ireland businesses and in the Northern Ireland economy in order to help them to recover, not just to mitigate as to where we are now, but in packages um, that uh, are really important around uh, the recovery of the economy. We are doing work on that. Um, there is significant work being done um, in uh, the department with our own economists, um, with some health economists, because um, I'm acutely aware that um, we will need to maintain um, some of the practices that we currently have in the workplace, but also I'm acutely aware um, that economic recession has its own health impacts, um, and we want to address these um, in, in a holistic manner. So um, we will be looking for a package for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, and one of the, the, the things that um, we will be looking at um, is, is, is something along the model of the, of the Welsh Resilience Fund, but not just the mitigation measures that it has in to take us a step further. I call Andrew Muir. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement and all the work that's been done to date by officials, not only in your department but also in the Department of Finance. It is greatly appreciated. In relation to the grants, um, unfortunately, my view very clearly is that the speed of delivery in relation to those is not acceptable. The significant numbers have still not received a 10K grant. We saw a survey that came out today from local chambers in relation to that. People are having to resort to benefit systems to be able to survive because of the delays associated with that. The delays around the 25K grants are just not acceptable. The timescales which were announced on Friday night left businesses in tears. And what is the Minister planning to do to ensure that the timescales and delivery of that assistance is accelerated? In Scotland, they announced a similar scheme around the 25K on exactly the same day you did, and the money was paid out on the 6th of April. Why is Northern Ireland again behind the curve in relation to assisting businesses? Can I thank uh, the member for his question? So let me address the 10K grant scheme uh, first of all. You have indicated that many thousands of businesses still have not um, been paid in relation to the 10K grant scheme. We indicated at the start of this that there were a number of businesses that we could pay directly because we already, or the, the LPS already held um, bank account details for those businesses. Those businesses have been paid. We opened the web portal um, for the remaining businesses and those businesses um, that have applied via the web portal have been paid. Of, we have around um, 1,700 applications uh, for grants. Over 15,000 of those have already been paid. Some of them are uh, waiting some verification. Some had some incorrect ratepayer ID numbers, you know, just mistakes in the application process, and we're working through that particular number. One of the things that I plan to do um, over the next uh, week or so is to try to have some uh, further public uh, announcements around the 10K grant scheme because we saw an initial rush of businesses applying to the scheme at the start um, and that has seen a tailing off over the last number uh, of days. So we want to remind businesses that uh, if they are eligible, if they receive small business rate relief or they are in receipt um, of industrial day rating, then they can apply for the 10K grant scheme, but they need to do so through the portal. We don't hold every, any, everyone that we have automatic details on, we have paid. Um, so then they need to do so through the portal. So we need um, to uh, harness your energies, your help, your support um, in uh, advising businesses in your local area that if you haven't applied to the 10K grant scheme, please do so through the portal if you fall into those particular ca uh, categories. So there are not tens of thousands of applications outstanding. There's a potential for many more to come in, but we need businesses to actually apply and to give us their details, and we will respond to that. So that's on that. On the 25K scheme, I've already explained that this is a new scheme. We had <coughs> prioritised the 10K scheme because obviously it reaches many, many more businesses. The 25K scheme is now there. Um, it is unfortunate that the portal is just um, not at a stage where it can go live at the moment. But as I said, I was speaking to the finance minister uh, today at the executive and we agreed that we would look at this again and see if there was a way that we could do it. And as soon as those applications are verified, as soon as we can verify them, the application system is not long, it is not complicated, but it does require verification as you would expect. Um, then as soon as they are verified, those businesses will be paid. <coughs> Members and, and ministers, uh, we have been averaging of five minutes for a question and an answer, and if that continues, only 12 of the 21 members who wish to ask the question will be afforded that opportunity. So uh, could I invite everyone to be much more focused and succinct in their questions and their answers? Uh, and I call Gordon Dunn. Mr. Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for her statement today. And I think we all recognise the work and the effort that she's put in and her staff within the economy department and, of course, the, the finance department. Um, I think it is important that we, as elected representatives, continue to lobby and to work to 
ensure that we, we do all we can to support our local businesses at this uh, very important time. And uh, again, I would urge the, the prompt action on the 25k grant. Can we have a question? Yes, indeed, uh, Deputy Speaker. I will get there. Uh, and again, I would emphasise the need for um, for prompt action. And perhaps the minister could comment on the point in, in that where we've noticed where leisure is now included, and I assume that would include uh, golf clubs and perhaps football clubs. And can we have just some further? clarification on the point that has been made earlier, that a number of businesses have fallen through the cracks and are not in any particular scheme. I have had an, an example of that within my own constituency today. A small manufacturing business who were delighted to hear about the, the change in the industrial D rating, but because they are over 15k NAV, they are not eligible. So I think we need to look at trying to broaden out the whole scheme and trying to include bus vital businesses like that. And thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> thank you to the member for his question. Um, yes, um, we will be looking at those businesses that um, have not been identified by any of the schemes that are so far available. Um, the Finance Minister, in his paper of last Friday, um, indicated that there was a further £40 million set aside um, to look at um, more schemes uh, for those businesses, and we fully intend to utilise that money um, to try and support businesses through a very, very difficult period. Um, it was decided um, that we would include leisure uh, within the 25k grant scheme um, because this is a, a mirror of the scheme that operates in the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, and leisure is part of that scheme as well. So it will be open to any leisure business um, that can uh, show that it has suffered hardship um, because uh, of the COVID-19 um, emergency that we're experiencing. I call Pat Cheaton. I will ask Kieran Corla, uh, and thanks to the Minister for her statement. Um, I am sure the Minister, like many other MLAs, has been contacted by companies who service gas boilers who are concerned about having to carry, carry out their work in the context of the, uh, the guidance on social distancing. And difficulties have been highlighted in terms of access and premises where uh, individuals are ill or social isolating, and uh, some premises where people are just reluctant to allow engineers to come into their premises. And this is a particular issue in the uh, rented and social housing sectors where the landlord has a statutory obligation to carry out annual servicing. Now, I know that the HSE guidance has stated that uh, these services can continue, but would the Minister not consider a temporary short-term suspension of the annual checks and a relaxation of the obligation on landlords that would alleviate some of these problems? I thank the member for his question. I have taken specific advice on this issue. Uh, from the Health and Safety Executive, and they advise um, that gas boilers do need regular servicing, that there is an obligation to ensure that those boilers are serviced. Um, I personally um, feel that this is, uh, and I understand the issues around social distancing, um, the, the, the ability to allow people into your home, etc., and I understand the reticence around that. Um, but I also am absolutely clear that we must put the safety uh, of people first, uh, whether they are in the private or public rented sector, um, and indeed advise um, uh, private individuals that if they have a gas boiler, then the servicing of that uh, gas boiler is an absolute must. Personally, I feel I could not live with myself if something happened to somebody because of an accident from a gas boiler that had not been serviced, although we have given uh, the contractors some latitude around the timing issue. I call Mervyn's story. Ask the Minister. She has expanded in terms of uh, the various grant schemes, and I thank her. Unlike some other members in this House today, we do appreciate all that has been done and is being done by your staff. But will she, particularly in relation to the small business, the one or the two person business, I think, for example, of a coach company in my own constituency that has fallen uh, below the 25 and the 10, and will they be eligible for the expansion that she has referred to? 
Thank you for the question. I can't, of course, give a specific guarantee on a specific um, example, but the intention is to look at businesses who um, have, at this minute in time, no route uh, to specific health help. Um, I, I, I think of I mean, I've, I've been contacted by coach operators, um, maybe someone who has a couple of coaches and who operates those uh, for the tourism industry, who has leasing uh, requirements on, on those vehicles and still overheads to pay, and yet tourism is all but stopped. So, and, and I do understand the issue. And I will um, hope to address some of those issues very, very um, much within uh, the new scheme that we'll be bringing forward. I'm also thinking of small businesses um, who um, perhaps are in an enterprise park who, for the park, pays the rate and the small businesses are not easily identifiable within that park. Those are businesses that are operating um, and we'd like to see uh, help extended uh, to them as well. The same with the social economy sector um, and we will be doing some work with finance to try to uh, help uh, with that sector as well. So there are still a number of issues that have to be addressed um, and we are committed to doing that um, within uh, a, a future scheme. I call Colin Gildenew. Gormay Agat, Las Kian Corlea, and thank you, Minister, for your statement and answers to questions here today. Uh, Minister, you will be aware that under the job retention scheme that furloughed workers will be adversely affected when seeking maternity entitlements. In the first 39 weeks of maternity leave, mothers are entitled to statutory maternity payments, which equate to 90% of their average gross weekly earnings. However, Instead of being entitled to 90% of their usual earnings, furloughed workers will instead be entitled to 90% of their furloughed earnings, which are, of course, only 80% of their regular wage. That discrepancy will skew the calculations of the average gross weekly earnings and place them at a financial disadvantage. So, will the Minister seek to address this issue with the British Treasury? Thank you for the question. Your colleague has already uh, written to me about this particular issue, um, and I have already taken it forward, um, and it is an issue that I recognise where there is that kind of anomaly, that a scheme brought forward in haste will always um, have people um, that it doesn't quite fit with. So, yes, is the answer. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you, the Minister, for coming and giving us an update. And uh, like other people, um, thank you to her officials and those in the Department of Finance, who I know, as a former civil servant, are working very hard on this stuff. It is difficult. This stuff does take time. Um, she has re referred to the devastating scale of the economic shock that Northern Ireland, indeed the entire world, faces. A new survey did out today from the various chambers, the Belfast, Derry, and Uri chambers, indicate that nearly half of businesses are not trading at all at the minute. In light of that, and in light of the depth of the economic shock, does she agree with me that the UK government's current position that it will not seek an extension to the Brexit transition, and I hate to be even mentioning Brexit in the current circumstances, is absurd if it wasn't immoral given how much it risks vital supply chains of food and medicine at the end of this year? At the end of last week, I wrote to the executive asking the First and Deputy First Ministers to, to make representations on behalf of all the Northern Ireland institutions, which are the only devolved institutions specifically mentioned in the Withdrawal Treaty, which she will well know given her past as an MEP. Will she agree with me that it is squalid and immoral that the UK Government will not ask for an extension in the current circumstances? Will she agree with me that the last thing that Northern Ireland business needs is the jeopardisation of supply chains the by the UK the leaving without a trade deal at the end of this year? Will she agree with me that the Northern the Ireland Executive should write question. to the UK Minister. Government and make those representations Minister. urgently? Thank you. Um, it's always nice to get back to the subjects that we know, <laughs> back to Brexit. <laughs> Order, order. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, and I um, specifically I wanted to address first it in two parts. You are right that there is a huge shock to the economy, not just um, the economy here in Northern Ireland, the world economy um, and to the UK economy. Um, I read a report uh, this morning which indicated that across the United Kingdom up to two million people following this could find themselves unemployed. Those are very, very sobering, very difficult statistics 
And remember, for every one of those, that's a family, that's a person, and, and those are very, very difficult issues. So there are huge um, issues to be dealt with um, within uh, the economy and, and how we actually proceed um, gently out of the, the, the phase we're in, bearing in mind that we need to keep people safe and keep lives safe. So, yes, I agree with you on that. In terms of Brexit, uh, it will, of course, be up to the United Kingdom government to decide um, whether um, it uh, would seek an extension or not. Um, there are a number of views around uh, seeking an extension. Um, some people believe that to seek an extension would merely be to prolong uh, the agony and that we could get this done uh, within uh, the required period of time. Um, others believe that actually to seek an extension would mean that we would simply further prop up the European Union, which will be under significant stress because of the downturn uh, in the world economy. Um, those are issues that, of course, we will discuss with the government um, in due course. Um, but for now, our focus pretty much on every meeting that we are um, involved with is on the immediate impact of COVID and the economic situation we're in. I call Steve Aiken. Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your remarks. Um, I was particularly struck by one of the things you said in your, when, in, when you were making your statement. When you said, when you were talking about rates, when you said, especially an extension in the rates holiday would make a positive contribution if the Northern Ireland Executive was able to match other parts of the UK. Could I ask you, Minister, whether the Northern Ireland Executive is exploring extending the rates holiday from three months out to six months and beyond? Because this is particularly important to critical areas of our economy. Thank you. Thank you for your question. It is very, very critical. Um, we currently have grant schemes that help businesses uh, with rateable values um, under 15. We have grant schemes that help businesses in certain sectors with rateable values uh, up to 51. Um, okay, um, but actually, um, for many of our businesses, the most significant help that we can give them um, is additional help uh, with uh, their rates bill. And a number of businesses have written to me about that, and I do believe that that would be a very significant contribution uh, to businesses going forward. I believe that we should extend the rate scheme uh, to match other parts of the United Kingdom, as you are well aware. It differs in some parts of the United Kingdom, but we should try to stretch ourselves to extend that, because I think that that is where we will give real help, um, particularly in our tourism and hotel sector and in some of uh, our, our retailers, who have actually been uh, really really, really uh, very, very badly hit uh, by the situation that we are in. So I am in full agreement with you. I have brought this issue up at the executive and will continue to push it. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement to the House today. And, and just on the back of the previous question, really, um, and we understand, fully appreciate and completely support social distancing um, measures, but uh, could the Minister comment on the harm to the economy from the current social distancing rules, and, and I'm thinking in particular of very personal uh, roles out there, like such as hairdressers, beauty salons, even dentists, and I declare an address to somebody who's rapidly growing much very long grey hair. Um, <laughs> But in a very, on a very serious point, Minister, that you know these are people's livelihoods, and they are desperately affected by them. So, has she a comment to make on that? Um, I too declare an interest. COVID hairstyles are not the best <laughs> that we've ever had. Um, Yes, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, when you think of, of um, those sectors of our economy um, that have simply had to close um, and will find it very, very difficult, some of them, uh, to open again. Um, and we really do um, need uh, to work with them into the future to try to ensure that they have the support they need. I'm aware that um, some um, of our um, local businesses will be able to avail of the furlough scheme um, and so on. 
but it is important um, that we recognise their contribution to the economy. Um, and I think that actually helping them further via rates is one of the issues that will be most significant to them, because they are such a huge part um, of the bills and the, the ongoing. Those are the standing bills that they have to pay, and those are the bills that they have to meet all the time. These are points I have made to the executive. I call John O'Dowd. Thank you, Minister, for your statement, also for the questions thus far. And my advice is go very gracefully. <laughs> uh, I, I welcome the fact that the executive has set aside £40 million for those businesses that fall between the streets, because just on my way here, I was notified by a business that employs 11 workers in a rural community that may fall between the streets, so there is hope there yet. But I specifically want to ask about insurance industries or the insurance business. And I know it's not a devolved matter, but I think the minister can have some influence in this. Insurance companies are refusing to pay out on the pandemic issue, even though businesses have been paying huge premiums over many, many years in good faith. Uh, will the Minister engage with, with, with the Treasury and others around this matter, and also in terms of the financial uh, regulators in relation to the insurance industry, to ensure that the insurance, insurance industry pays out to the businesses that have been paying out their premium? Yes, um, is the short answer to that. I too know businesses um, in my own area in Upper Ban and um, further across Northern Ireland um, who have paid um, for uh, cover for these exact uh, reasons and because COVID-19 is not named on the policy have been told that they cannot claim uh, in the current pandemic. Um, I think there is a bit of a mixed message that has come from the government in the past about, you know, oh, they'll pay out because I say they'll pay out. But of course, the insurance industry doesn't operate like that. And I will, of course, continue to uh, make representation on those businesses' behalf because this cover is significant. It's quite an outlay for businesses um, to do it. And some of them thought um, that uh, in, in uh, covering themselves this way, that life would be a little easier and our very disappointed to find that they, they are not included. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In response to a previous question with regards to extreme cash flow problems facing businesses ineligible for existing grant schemes, the Minister advised that Invest NI is scoping a recovery package. This isn't an issue of recovery, it's an issue of survival. Given that cash flow is such a serious problem, for such businesses, when will the Minister follow the lead of Scotland and Wales and deliver that hardship cash funding to ensure businesses survive? I actually think that there are two elements to the work uh, that we would have to do. One is those mitigation um, elements, um, and um, we have outlined uh, the work that has been done to date so far. And those are really important. They're really important for the survival uh, of businesses and how businesses will be able um, to pick up again. But I think also there is uh, an issue for us, and we would be doing wrong if we were not actually um, looking and planning for recovery and for the future. And that's also an important part of our work uh, and something which we again discussed at the executive today um, and something that I will be discussing again with them on Monday. And some of the actions that I think that need to be taken uh, and some uh, of the issues that will need to be dealt with. And it's always good uh, to have uh, those uh, people to advise and support policy decisions of government going forward. I call Alex Eason. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for her statement so far? Um, as the Minister is aware, um, the impact on our air connectivity has been substantial. Does she have any plans to help with that uh, for the foreseeable future when we maybe get back into the way of things? Um, thank you. That is a, a really valuable and um, a really important piece uh, of the work uh, that we've been doing over the last uh, number of weeks. Our air connectivity in Northern Ireland is now at an absolutely critical stage. There are no flights, um, bar uh, freight flights, out of Belfast International. Um, the city of Derry Airport um, is down to one flight, um, which is the public supported flight um, per day. 
Um, and just last week, BA announced that they were discontinuing the London Heathrow route temporarily, um, and that the only flight that there would be would be a flight uh, via Aer Lingus, a return flight per day. So Northern Ireland's air connectivity to the rest of the United Kingdom is absolutely at a critical stage. Um, and I think that we all, as members of this House, need to be aware and cognizant of that. I have been working um, with uh, the Department for Transport in London, as has uh, Nicola Mallon and uh, Conor Murphy in finance, uh, in trying to um, bring forward help and support for those airports and particularly for the routes um, that uh, keep us connected to the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, we want to ensure that when we are able uh, to pick up with the economy, when um, air travel resumes, that we are able uh, to have airports that are in a position um, to, to service that uh, demand within the economy and that we have routes there to do so. I speak on a regular basis, probably weekly, with every one uh, of the, the uh, airports um, and my officials uh, are constant contact on this issue. I hope um, and I th think that it will have positive results, um, but it will be for both uh, the Department for Transport and the local executive to ensure that our air connectivity to our biggest market is maintained um, and that our airports uh, are resilient going into the future. I call Melissa McHugh. last <coughs> and you got it right this time. Because <laughs> I, we uh, have uh, the Ratchis Foster uh, Minister. Thank you for your statement as well, uh, Minister. The grant schemes that have been announced so far have been welcome, but they've been directed towards <laughs> businesses with premises. The self-employed scheme for those who are eligible won't be available until June. So, what supports? Have been looked at for those sole traders or businesses without premises in the interim. I hope that that support will be resolved through uh, the additional scheme that will be announced shortly. I call Colin McGrath. Much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. Can I echo the uh, remarks made earlier about golf clubs? I know a number have contacted me there, uh, and they feel that they fall in between a number of the stools, but maybe the inclusion of leisure uh, would be something that could help them, because they also see themselves very much as tourist providers. Uh, certainly the ones in my constituency, like our Glass Golf Club and Royal County Down, are certainly visited by many people from outside um, Ireland. Um, and maybe as well, then there's uh, a number of businesses that do not hold rateable, uh, a number of tourism businesses that do not hold rateable value, such as the St Patrick's Centre, and there are others. Um, could they be considered in your deliberations about some of the businesses that might have fallen between the cracks? Um, yes, uh, is, is the, the, again the short answer to that one. Um, we want to try. Look. It's, there, there's such a myriad of different business models and, and the way those businesses um, present themselves and interact with government and, and with agencies and the ability to identify them. Um, and hopefully um, a scheme that isn't too prescriptive but that allows different businesses to uh, apply uh, will help in, in identifying those businesses um, that so far haven't been easily identifiable through the existing channels that we have. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker and Minister. Thank you for your statement. Um, it's with regard to small business, the small business grant. Can you confirm if a business who pays rates on a number of different properties will be entitled to an equal number of grants? I think of a business that's ran under one title, but has properties perhaps in Enniskillen, uh, Enniskillen, Oma, Banbridge, etc. Can I thank the, the member for a question? And this is an issue um, that is brought up to me on a regular basis. Um, the executive decided that uh, the small business grant scheme and the 25,000 grant scheme would be one grant per business, uh, irrespective of the number of outlets that that business had. 
So um, that's where it is um, at the moment. However, I do recognise the difficulties that that uh, presents. Um, and when we see how the scheme uh, works out, I would like to try some sort of a mop-up exercise for some of those uh, more difficult issues within the scheme uh, and see uh, how, how those can be addressed. But at the moment, the guidance is, is clear, so it is one grant per business, um, irrespective of the outlets that those businesses have. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement, um, but also for her reminder to us that um, this is the biggest health emergency ever faced. And she is absolutely right that the daily death toll from this virus um, is horrendous, um, and, and the numbers will continue to rise for some time yet. But in regard to her comment that um, a small number of companies remain open with strict social distancing measures in place and that you will do everything within your power to ensure that we have a safe work, workplace and workforce. Um, what can the Minister do for those numerous workers, particularly from retail and the postal sector who are in contact with me, given no option but to continue working, um, who contact me in serious distress, telling me stories that behind the scenes where we don't see in the shop floor and in the warehouses and the freezers, that they're being told to share uniforms, jackets and gloves for postal workers who are saying that they're busier than Christmas, that their distribution centres are now taking the overflow of Amazon because they're on a bumper bonanza um, dealing with the, the, the consumerism that's going on. Uh, and to quote one postal worker who told me that, um, why am I delivering new clothes to people who've got nowhere to go to wear them? The while, member has asked her a question. While they're still feeling that social distancing is not in place, that adequate sanitation for hand washing, etc., is not in place. What is in her power to do to help reassure and make sure that they have safety? You're quite right. Um, I've said it over and over again. I make no apology for saying it, that the workplace should be safe. Um, and I have worked, um, and the Health and Safety Executive work, and the Public Health Agency has worked with a number of firms um, where which there were very well-known uh, issues um, in, in previous weeks um, to try and resolve some of those issues. And in fairness to firms and many of our food firms, they have stepped up to the plate and they have actually spent quite significant amounts of money in trying to ensure that they have appropriate and safe working conditions for the people that work there. And that includes looking at the kind of choke points where you clock in, canteens, changing, etc. Et so uh, there are many firms doing very, very good things and they should be commended for that. Uh, and particularly some of the agri-food firms that I have worked with over the last number of weeks um, to help them achieve uh, the standards that they have now. But we're not complacent. And the message still is, absolutely, that you must provide a safe workplace. And if you are not providing a safe workplace, um, then those uh, people within that workplace should take up that complaint with the health and safety executive who will investigate, but who will work with that workplace and with that business to try to ensure um, that um, the workplace is safe and that they can work together to make sure that there are proper and appropriate measures in place. In this um, day, I mean, I, I don't know the complaints, they haven't come to me, but um, I would suspect um, that anyone uh, asking people to share uniforms is, is, is something that we should absolutely not be doing. So if there are uh, complaints, I would encourage you to uh, contact the Health and Safety Executive and make sure that those complaints are investigated. But the message from me as Minister is absolutely clear. The workplace must be safe. Called Jim Allister. Two weeks ago, uh, when the executive was publicly rowing about whether businesses should be open or closed, your response minister was to announce a stakeholders forum, which was going to bring forward the answer. Three weeks later, we still haven't got the answer. Is there yet an agreed executive position on whether a business which can practice safe distancing can and should be open, because at the end of all this, we still have to have an economy. Can we please have some direction 
that allows such businesses to open conscience-free, instead of being some ministers pretending that they are indeed inhibiting public health. Thank you um, for the member for the question. I have already addressed this, but perhaps the member wasn't in the chamber at the time. Um, I um, in, asked uh, the forum to come together. That is indeed a forum of uh, unions and of uh, significant uh, business representative bodies. They have worked very well uh, on the issue. They have produced a um, guidance on uh, workplace practices, uh, which I will take to the executive in the executive paper on Friday. Um, they have also produced um, a list uh, of essential uh, workers. It will be for the executive to decide how they take that forward, um, but um, we uh, will have that discussion on Friday. I don't want to preempt that discussion. Uh, but the member knows very, very clearly um, that I want this economy to thrive and to do well, but I want people to be safe and for the health of our people to be looked after as well. So we have to find the balance between the two, and these are the difficult choices and decisions that have to be made at the moment. So yes, there is a, a, a substantial piece of work from the forum. I thank them for that. Um, and that will be considered by the Executive on Friday. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you. Uh, the Minister stated that 25,000 job losses could be lost uh, in the short term. Uh, one estimate says that 100,000 job losses could be lost in total uh, here. Does the Minister accept that the current economic strategy, uh, one of over-reliance on the market, hasn't always worked in terms of getting PPE and testing, but to name two issues? And if so, does she believe that uh, at the other side of this, of this crisis we need to have a different economic approach that isn't focused solely on the interests of the market or maximising private profits, but actually meeting human need in terms of food, housing and, and other issues? And I just wanted to finally ask her what role has her department played, if any, to coordinate, direct and, if necessary, implore industry and business, uh, businesses to do all they can uh, in terms of tackling uh, this crisis? Thank you. I'll take the last piece of that uh, first. I am actually very proud of the businesses in Northern Ireland. Many of them, um, like O'Neill's, uh, faced uh, the closure of their business, but they repurposed and they're producing scrubs for the NHS. They're actually doing work that is um, crucial and vital uh, to the fight against COVID-19. Other business, I think of a blind company in Northern Ireland that is producing visors for those people who work with COVID positive patients. Um, and companies in Northern Ireland have been doing an enormous amount of innovative work, repurposing um, and actually thinking of how they can help uh, in a very, very difficult uh, crisis for them. So that's, that's and, and I pay tribute uh, to each and every one of them. Even those, and, and Food companies, um, supermarkets, people who continuously go out day after day to meet the public and do their job. And, that's, that, and we as a whole should be making that tribute to them um, here in this house. That is very important. Um, in terms of um, whether um, I believe there has been an over-reliance on the market, I'm, I suspect very, very strongly uh, that the member and I will not agree um, on economic strategy, but I'm congratulating him for getting that into the question uh, on, on this particular occasion. Um, yes, I think that the impact on jobs will be very severe and very great. That is why I am keen to try to get measures in place that will help us with economic recovery. That's why I'm keen to continuously talk to businesses about their needs and how I'm keen to um, work with Executive College to have a package which will actually help us uh, to recover uh, and to keep our businesses resilient in the face of a, a very, very grave crisis. And that concludes questions on the Minister's statement. Item 4 on the agenda, time, date and place of our next meeting. We have received confirmation from the Infrastructure Minister that she wishes to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at a meeting to be held tomorrow afternoon, Thursday the 16th of April. We have also received confirmation from the Education Minister 
that he wishes to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at the meeting to be held tomorrow afternoon. Formal notification has been sent uh, by the Speaker's Office to members. And that concludes this meeting of the ad hoc committee. Uh, the meeting is adjourned and I invite members to leave by the nearest door. <laughs>